Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen mother-in-law installed a hidden camera in my bedroom. My husband, male 33, got into a car accident almost a month ago. He's been bedridden due to a back injury and I've been his primary caregiver. The pressure has been too much for my mother-in-law. She keeps telling me to take care of him and be there for him constantly. She begged me to take time off work and I did asked me to send her hourly updates about his condition the first two weeks but when i didn't she'd get mad and cause an issue she visits every day but doesn't do anything to help alternatively she lists all the things i should or shouldn't do the family keeps telling me she's just worried sick for her son so i should try to stay calm days ago she called to berate me about not replacing the sheets quickly i had no idea how she found out since my husband didn't call her my sister-in-law called me to tell me that her mom installed a camera in the bedroom to see if I was taking proper care of her son. I was stunned. After searching the room, I found the camera. I called my mother-in-law and had a huge fight with her. She admitted it and said that she was just feeling concerned and wanted to make sure her son was being cared for, despite him calling her every day. I yelled at her, telling her that she's no longer allowed into my home after this. She lost it and went on a rant about how I'm stopping her from seeing her son and that not seeing him will literally make her sick herself. The family called me later to get me to back out of this decision, but I told them she breached my privacy and took advantage of the situation. She said I'm taking it too personally and that I can't blame a concerned mother for wanting to make sure her son is fine, especially since she listed things she thought I was doing wrong. I ended the conversation, but my husband is upset telling me I'm being vindictive and that if his mom can't come, then he'll move there for her. We argued, then I went outside and he's been silent ever since. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Report it to the police. Let your husband go home to his mummy. Let his broke body self go live with his mama and when he gets better, the locks should be changed. Mama's boys and crazy mama bears are horrible. Not the jerk. Let your husband move out then. That woman should be arrested. What kind of family is this? Get out of Dodge before you are entangled and have kids. Right? If he's threatening to move back to his mommy, just let him. Not the jerk. I have a feeling she never would have uninstalled it. Check the rest of your house and block anyone who doesn't respect your autonomy and privacy. Maybe change the Wi-Fi. Likely it's a Wi-Fi camera and it'll lose its connection if you change the password. Not the jerk. Let him move, problem solved. Where's the conflict? The relationship is probably over, but have you not realized your husband knew about the camera? She installed it while he was in the room. Well, what would you do in this situation? If your mother-in-law installed a hidden camera in your bedroom, please let us know. Do they have money? Maybe you can sue. I know I'd give it a shot. Sister-in-law is using me as a free babysitter during our family vacation. My fiance and I were invited to go along on a trip to California for a week. I do not have my kids with me due to them being with their father and having wrestling tournaments that they cannot miss. Already spent hundreds on non-refundable tickets for them to participate. We drove here with his family, so I was already quite exhausted when getting to the resort after having listened to an 8-month-old scream practically the entire ride, 23 hours, but they insisted we go with them for the drive to swap off driving and sightseeing. We were crammed in this vehicle like sardines because on the floor was their family dogs, a 75-pound bull mastiff with her two puppies. So yes, dog crap was also present. They were quick to clean it up, but still, the car was putrid. When we get to the resort, I quickly noticed how I was seen as a built-in babysitter for my fiancé's sister's eight-month-old daughter. Every time my future sister-in-law and her husband wanted to take a shower or swim or eat, or even if they just didn't feel like holding her. The kid was thrown in my lap, basically, every single time. There are five other adults here, 
but they claimed that the kid only wanted me. I can't exactly argue it, because at this point, I had held the baby so much that she did put her arms out for me quite often, even in passing in the hallway. But it hit a point where I was getting tired. I was in the pool yesterday, and my future sister-in-law gets in and within five minutes passes the baby off to me. I hand her back maybe 10 minutes later, claiming I needed to use the restroom and stay indoors. Maybe 15 minutes later, they come inside and pass the baby off to me again, saying they need to go shower and ask me to bring the baby into them in 10 minutes. After I pass the baby off to them, I lock myself in the room and I've barely left since. My fiance comes in here a bit ago and tells me we are all going out to eat and I told him I didn't feel like going and becoming a high chair to the baby while her parents ate. As it is, I've already held this kid more than enough and had several drinks spilled on me because of her octopus arms. He said I can't just sit up here to avoid holding the baby and that I'm wasting the trip all because I won't say no. Half the time they don't ask though. The baby is practically tossed to me. Am I the jerk? Not gonna lie, I would have flown home already. Not the jerk. I was thinking the same thing. My kids would have a sudden need for me and I would fly home. She's in a no-win situation. If she says no, she will be the jerk in family lore forever. Her only hope would be for the fiancé to call his sister out hard and shame her into knocking it off. I don't know, man. I'd at least try to say no in a kind way. Sorry, but right now I really want to have some time to myself to relax. There are other people you could ask and stay firm. Doesn't immediately make her the jerk. OP hasn't even said no once. I don't think she would be a jerk at all. I think her in-laws would absolutely see her as being a jerk. They already are so far beyond good manners with how they are pushing their daughter onto OP. They will surely get immediately offended as if OP is rejecting their sweet angel baby who loves OP so much. I'm sorry that bothers you, OP. OP is not the jerk, but she is being a jerk to herself by not growing a backbone. She would rather ruin her entire trip than set boundaries. That's on her. I'm busy swimming right now but thanks. Maybe you should ask them if they can watch the baby while you go shower. I'm busy eating. I'm not interested in holding the baby at this moment. If I'd like to hold the baby, I will let you know. No thank you, I'm good right now. I love the baby, but I'm all babied out right now. Maybe some other time. Stop accommodating it. You're just as much at fault for not declining as they are. They've set the precedent that you are happy to hold the baby all the time because every time they pass the baby off to you, you accept it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her in-laws? Please let us know. You have to be firm when dealing with entitled parents. If you're not, they'll use you for whatever you're worth to them. Am I the jerk for telling my sister I don't care what happens to her baby and she would be an awful mother? The title sounds literally awful and I feel awful. I'm 17 female and my sister Veronica, who's 19, accidentally got pregnant. I think having a little niece or a nephew would be nice but whatever Veronica wants to do is fine by me. She decided to keep it and my parents are beyond ecstatic. Veronica and I aren't close. She was barely home growing up and my parents both left for work at 6 a.m. and got back just in time for dinner. I basically raised my little siblings who are 11, 14, and 13. Me and my little siblings are really close and spend most of our time together, but Veronica always relied on friends. Veronica tries her best to disturb peace in the family causing fights with my sisters over little things like spraying too much perfume or commenting on their looks. But whenever we fight with her, she threatens to not have her kid as if we are going to drop to our knees and beg her not to. My parents protect her in every fight and they think she can do no wrong because she is blessing them with their first grandbaby. Over the past few weeks, I've been working hard to buy a gift for my little sister, just an expensive perfume she wants, which was about $110. Expensive, I know, but she was really wanting it. Not even two days into her having it, her and Veronica got into a fight over God knows what. Veronica took the perfume and a few other of her belongings and threw them off the balcony. This upset me so much, because not only did I spend so much on that, but also that was my little sister's stuff that she valued. My little sister was crying while my other little sister was consoling her. Veronica was staring at her with a smirk on her face, as if she was proud of being a fully grown adult and destroying a barely teenager's stuff. I went absolutely crazy on Veronica, essentially telling her to go forget herself. She started saying, I dare you to hit me. 
I'll get rid of this baby. I don't give a hoot. I was confused as this had nothing to do with her kid. And I said, I don't care what happens to that thing. You'd be an awful mother anyways. My parents came to her rescue and told me to either get over myself or move out. So I said, okay, and went to my boyfriend's house. I've been getting calls and texts from my parents and Veronica telling me to come back and talk this out, also saying I'm an awful person for saying this to my poor sister. I feel bad, but my boyfriend is telling me that they're treating me like dirt, and he doesn't think I should go back there unless I really want to. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but your parents are, along with Veronica. One, for the parentification. Two, for prioritizing their unborn grandchild over the well-being of the actual kid that they're responsible for. I would not be surprised if they expect you to be heavily involved in childcare once this baby is born since the mom hardly seems responsible. Totally agreed. Veronica doesn't seem like she would mature soon. They are definitely counting on OP to yet again raise another kid that's not her responsibility. That's when you hit her over the head with a call to the authorities and get the baby taken away. ETA, not the jerk since I forgot. And OP, you really should start documenting all these things she's doing. From the way she treats your other siblings to the threats that she makes to get her way and anything else I missed. Keep track of dates and times and whatnot and get the other kids to do it too if they won't mind. I'm sorry your parents are such jerks too. From parentifying you and treating your older sister with such favoritism, you should get a part-time job if you can and make your parents actually, you know, act like parents. It's not your job. Not the jerk. The only response to their text should be, has Veronica apologized to my little sister and replaced her belongings yet? Your boyfriend is right and you should stay miles away. If Veronica wants to cause property damage, she can deal with some harsh words in response. Not the jerk. She absolutely would be an awful mother. Your poor younger sister. Veronica is crazy and your parents are acting completely useless as parents in this situation. Sounds like a fairy tale evil stepsister story to me. You're lying about something. No one acts like this in the real world. But down to the basics. Not the jerk, I think. You are responsible for your actions. So is your sister. She did not accidentally get pregnant. That's not a thing. She was either negligent, which is not accidental, or more likely got pregnant on purpose. The story is a biased version of reality, and I guarantee you no one else involved will give the same story. If you did something wrong, own up to it and apologize. If they did something wrong, cut toxic people out of your life and don't look back. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Veronica? Please let us know. Veronica will be a trash mom. What a sick person. If she does have that baby, I hope it finds a good family. Ex-husband ghosts ex-wife, racks up a huge bill he clearly didn't think things through. My compliance was malicious for the ex-husband. I'm working in the billing queue in a call center for one of the big three telcos and a client calls in regarding a billing concern. This lady calls in, is puzzled by why she got charged a one-time fee of $49 for a wireless access point. It's generation one equipment for wireless set-top boxes for optic TV. She's even more puzzled, why would she have that charge when she doesn't even have TV services from us? And I inform her she does. It started more or less a month ago. She's disputing that because Optic TV isn't available in her area. Now I'm confused. She lives in a small town and there's no Optic TV there. I do a little digging and find out that someone, ex-husband, was still on her account and got a three-year contract to get a free TV for Optic TV and internet. She begins to cry on the phone and tells me her now ex-husband had an affair with a younger woman, divorced her, milked her for as much as he could and apparently still is milking her for more. He totally ghosted her, moved to Alberta, changed his email, phone number, blocked her on all social media, etc. In my mind, I'm like, what a jerk. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry if you cancel the services, you're on the hook to pay for cancellation fees and so on. I can tell her though, I can remove his access to your account and you can also add on a password. Downgrade the internet and TV to the bare essentials and I can attempt to redirect the TV gift from his address to yours, but there's no guarantee as it's already been processed. I can hear the light going off in her head. Wait, what? You have where he's living at now? Why yes, he's got TV and internet services, so there's a service address. She goes really quiet 
says her lawyer and herself have been trying to track him down, but his family and friends are being tight-lipped about it. She asks if I'm allowed to give her that info. I smile and reply, this is your account. You have unrestricted access for service address, phone numbers, emails that your now ex-husband provided to us to get hooked up. She asks, can I give her his new address, his new cell number, and the second number left on the account, presumably the new woman, and contact info over the phone right now. I asked if she had a pen and paper handy. She was so ecstatic, and after giving her all the details from her account regarding the second service address, downgrade everything, and he was a hockey fan, and there was a game playing right now with his team. So I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when the game cuts out, and he calls in to find out what's going on, and discovers he's been removed, and there's an account pin, and he's been discovered by his ex-wife and her lawyer. I cancelled my brat daughter's birthday. I know how the title sounds, but hear me out. I, 40 female, have two daughters. One recently turned 16 and one is 11. My 16-year-old, Fiona, is very into fashion right now. She loves to watch Project Runway, RuPaul's Drag Race, basically anything to do with fashion. For her birthday, my husband, who's 44, and I bought a rather pricey sewing machine for her. We agreed that although this would be an expensive purchase, it was one that Fiona would really enjoy for her 16th birthday. Two weeks before Fiona's birthday, my youngest, Kathy, was running to me sobbing. Her beloved American Girl doll was missing. I tried to calm her down while my husband looked around the house. A few hours later, Fiona arrived home after shopping with some friends. I told her about the situation and Fiona promptly said, Oh, that old thing? I sold it. If ever there was a record scratch in real life moment, this was it for me. Fiona then told me that she needed some money for a new spring wardrobe and didn't think Kathy would mind since she rarely plays with that thing. It just sits there creepily in whatever outfit she puts it in. Kathy was in the room and burst into tears once more. My husband swiftly removes her from the room while I stare down my oldest. Fiona had this almost sly smile on her face before telling me, I know you're going to say to return everything, but almost all of the clothes were on final sale, so I can't. I told her she was grounded before sending her to her room. I then sprung into action on getting Kathy her doll back. Took some time, but I was able to not only cancel the FedEx delivery, but the eBay seller understood the situation and accepted a refund. Now, the problem with Fiona. I checked the receipts of the various stores, and sure enough, my daughter bought almost everything on final sale. My husband and I were out around $700. My husband and I returned the sewing machine to help cover our financial loss. As for Fiona's birthday, we could still have dinner at his parents' house with the cousins and whatnot, but no gifts. A few days before, my husband and I sat Fiona down and explained that due to her theft, she would no longer be getting the sewing machine for her birthday. She wouldn't be receiving any other gifts either. She did not take it well. A few days later, I started receiving messages from more distant relatives and some of Fiona's friends. Apparently, I'm a complete jerk for canceling my daughter's birthday and telling other people that she couldn't receive gifts. Fiona posted this story all over social media. I know that my daughter is hurting, but these are the consequences of her actions. Still, part of me wonders whether or not I went too far by barring everyone from giving her gifts. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. But why are you not more concerned about this behavior aside from the money? Either this is out of character for Fiona, in which case you need to worry about what changed, or this is in character for Fiona, and you need to worry about having raised a terribly, almost absurdly entitled teen. OP, this is very out of character for her. I was worried that my husband and I went too far in the punishment, which is why I wanted a third party opinion. With respect, I suggest you revisit the out of character assumption after you have talked to your other daughter. I grew up with a sibling who had our folks completely bamboozled and who refused to believe what his character truly was, even when confronted with evidence. Sometimes it's hard to rationally assess people you love. But look at this field of red flags. Your daughter stole from someone younger and weaker something she knew was important and expensive. She secretly sold it and used the proceeds to buy things she knew could not be returned. Her initial response was to preemptively inform you, with a sly smile, that your options for enforcing restitution were limited. Her secondary response was to go public and control the narrative, not to apologize and try to make amends. This is not normal. 
That requires planning and cunning. That is approaching personality disorder behavior, and it would be in everyone's best interest for you to seek professional help rather than being like, I just don't know what's gotten into her. Exactly. She didn't sell something she had. If she's so into fashion, she could have sold her clothes on Poshmark or wherever. Selling an item on eBay takes time and thought. She purposefully did over her sister and purposefully purchased things she knew couldn't be returned. Also, I would argue her new spring wardrobe is her birthday present. You did give her something since you aren't forcing her to pay the $700 back. Your daughter is the jerk. You're not. Not the jerk. You're being nice for allowing the dinner still for her birthday. I doubt the people reaching out to y'all know the full story. OP. I've explained it to a few of them, but many still think that ordering others to not give her gifts was overextending my parenting power. Needless to say, I now know which relatives to avoid. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her daughter? Please let us know. I'd make that brat get a job and pay you and your husband back. $700 is a lot of money. What happens when an engineer's management is incompetent? I'm a factory automation engineer with companies like Tesla on my resume. At my current factory job, shortly after I joined the company, I solved a problem that one of our processes had been having for literally the entire 20 years this factory has been standing because my specific educational focus in engineering school was centered around exactly the kind of problem this process was having. I had the permission from my direct supervisor and production management to implement the fix for this specific factory line. The other lines were running well enough without it so that I didn't feel it was necessary to apply it across the factory. It was just this one line that ran like crap for whatever reason, so I fixed the problem I saw. I did this for about six months and managed to fix problems with literally dozens of different processes across the factory. All the while, I had no idea that there was a rule determined by our corporate engineering manager that all factory processes had to run on the same set of control parameters and that we were forbidden from changing the parameters that I had been running around changing. I didn't know this was a rule, and I never thought to consider that it might be a rule, because it's an absolutely stupid rule, because process controls are supposed to be tuned individually to the equipment they're controlling. Every piece of industrial hardware is slightly different, even when the equipment is ostensibly identical. Without getting too technical, things like electric motors have subtle variations in the windings that make them respond differently to current flowing through them. Heating units have slightly different thermal mass and other properties that make them heat up a little faster or slower. The automated controls for those processes have to use slightly different control parameters to account for these subtle differences in equipment. But apparently, this manager read about corporate standardization in a book somewhere and decided that every line across all of our factories needed to run the same controller constants. He had spent years in his own factory forcing his technicians to find a single set of parameters that worked across all lines. Apparently, he managed to find a set of parameters that didn't cause the equipment to catch fire. So, in his infinite wisdom, he had spent the last five or six years shoving that mandate to all of his technicians and subordinate engineers so that he could report to his bosses that he had been putting the hammer down, standardizing our processes. So in his eyes, I was messing up the whole factory by tuning these controller constants to match the hardware they were running on. After trying to explain, that's not how any of this works, and getting about as far as that old lady in the commercial, I acquiesced to the manager's very explicit and stern demands to put everything back exactly the way it was supposed to be. I barely managed to avoid being fired on the spot by apologizing profusely for my mistake because I didn't realize that there was a standard in place. So when scrap and quality rejects at our factory doubled in a single week and we lost about 70 hours of uptime because of jammed up processes at a cost of about $10,000 an hour and lost productivity, there was suddenly a big meeting demanded by corporate to come yell at us for costing the company about $2 million in one week because of all the increased scrap and downtime. At that meeting, I explained exactly the changes that I had been making to the processes over the course of the previous six months. I had charts from our historian for every single process before I made my original changes, after I made the changes, and after I was compelled under the threat of losing my job to revert all the changes I made back to the original parameters. I got the opportunity to explain to that engineering manager's boss that homogenizing code and standardizing processes is a good idea on the whole, but that there are specific equipment parameters that need to be tuned individually for each process they are running on. 
and that those parameters often need to be retuned if something about the process changes in a way that affects the performance of that process, such as changes in materials or natural wear and tear on components. And I explained that while one factory was able to find a set of parameters that worked across all their lines without causing catastrophic failures, most of those lines were actually performing quite sluggishly. And I demonstrated using our own plant's data how similarly performing lines at our factory before my changes dramatically improved yield and uptime when the processes were tuned individually. The corporate engineering manager got fired and I got 40% of my annual salary as a bonus this year along with everyone at my plant getting maxed out bonuses because of how well the plant performed this year. District manager wanted us to treat customers like our best friend. Okay. Retail time. Those were the days. I worked in the number three office supply chain in the country. Small flex, as there were only three office supply chains at the time. Well, I had one of those district managers that went to district manager school and did all the district manager things. You know, sending emails with random words in bold, different fonts, colors. His emails read like William Shatner having a stroke. The dude was a company man, read over enthusiastic. Corporate had released a new policy about how we should set the standard for customer interaction. Don't just say hi or welcome to when a customer walks in, but treat them like you're happy that they're there. Express interest in them on a unique level. If they're wearing a sports team hat, and you know the team, say, hey, great game last night, right? The general idea was to personalize the experience. Don't just sound like an NPC in a video game saying the same lines again and again to everyone. Well, Mr. District Manager Guy, living close to our store, popped in the day of the store meeting where this was all announced and decided to encourage us and lead by example. That's actually pretty cool of a district manager to do. But he also had a history of throwing tantrums and we were like the bad news bears of the district, so it was more treating us like little kids. It felt more condescending than anything. Mr. District Manager interpreted the new policy to be, talk to the customer like they are your best friend. We role played, and he would berate employee after employee to get it right. Role playing in retail is always awkward, and this isn't a theater troupe. They aren't trained actors. The majority of the staff is first time job high school kids and part time college kids. I was the latter. Our performances were not Hollywood. He wanted Hollywood. And me? I'm a sarcastic clown who loves having a little fun. The kind of guy that practices making ridiculous faces in the mirror so I can try them out on unsuspecting friends later. I love an audience. Don't give me an excuse to be ridiculous. So the store opens at 8am. Customers start coming in and Mr. District Manager is still there, watching our performance and rating us, but not being as loudly snide in front of the customers. Finally, it's my turn, and he's, once again, repeating out loud, Remember, you need to treat the customer like you would treat your best friend walking into your house. I recognized the customer who walked in, an old guy in his 60s we gave the nickname of Reno, and I know he heard every word Mr. District Manager said. Reno is one of our favorite customers. You're about to understand why. Reno walks right up to me. I say, Hey dude, what's up? Reno says, you know, man, same crap, different day, right? I say, tell me about it. My district manager has been a real pain in the butt lately with some dumb new idea that's probably going to blow up in his face. Reno laughs. Sounds about right. Hey, I need to get some folders for a presentation for the condo association. Know where those are? I say, back of the store. Find them yourself, dude. I'm not your servant. Reno says, fair enough. Think your manager buddy has figured out how stupid this is yet? I say, I don't know, man, he's not that bright. Reno laughs, loud as he is prone to, and takes a step to my district manager, gives him a big slap on the arm, the kind that ends with his hand gripping the arm high up by the shoulder, stares him in the eyes, and gives his shoulder a small shake. I think he'll figure it out. He doesn't want to make the store's best customer angry, and Reno walks off. Mr. District Manager is beat red angry. If he were a cartoon, there would be steam. He breathes and practically hisses through clenched teeth, asking, Just what the heck was I trying to pull? I try my best, Joey from Friends. What? You said treat him like my best friend, and Reno practically lives here. I got written up again that day. Hashtag worth it. So many times I should have been fired from that job. Also, this was like 2004, 
so obviously I didn't get the word-for-word -word banter perfectly memorized. But that's the kind of guy Reno was, and that's the kind of employee I was, and that's the setup we were given. Am I the jerk for calling my fiancé entitled over a wedding planning dispute? I just got engaged to Anna, and we are in the very early stages of wedding planning. We can afford to pay for it ourselves, but it will be a small DIY wedding. I knew that my parents were going to offer to pay because I'm the last to get married and they paid for both of my siblings. Anna and I have talked about my parents' money before and mutually decided that when they offer to buy us a house, not trying to be an entitled jerk, but they bought both of my siblings a house, we are going to decline because it comes with strings attached. My mom drops by whenever she wants. My mom makes executive parenting decisions for my sister and sister-in-law, and Anna and I don't want that. We had dinner with my parents recently, and my dad offered us $70,000 for the wedding. I saw Anna's eyes light up. I asked what the strings would be, and my dad said we would have to let my mom help plan, invite a certain number of their friends, make sure the food included things they liked, and if he was spending that sort of money, it wasn't just for us. His wife better be happy. I told Anna it was her call. Anna got upset and said no to the conditions, which I was fine with. Anna then said my parents are selfish, which okay, fair enough. Then she started to beg for the $70,000 without the strings. My dad said that was out of the question. She kept it up, so I changed the subject. The next morning, she told me she was going to call my mom and try to convince her to drop the conditions. I told her that she was being entitled and they have the right to give conditions. I wouldn't personally do it, but I think it's their right. I told her that if she called my mom, it would embarrass me because of the entitledness. She now thinks I'm on their side and she's deeply hurt that I use the word entitled because she prides herself on being a hard worker. My fiance demands I set up a trust fund for her kids. I'm 46, male. My fiance is 45, female. And my ex-wife is 42. My ex-wife and I are on great terms and throughout and after our marriage, we've been creating a trust fund for our boys who are 19 and 16 and they can do what they want with it when they're 24. I have my company that has skyrocketed since I started it over 25 years ago due to the need for it in the technological world and it is branched throughout the US. So our boys and my ex-wife have been very well off and they'll all be taken care of if I pass since I don't plan on changing my will yet. Everything goes to them. Our sons are very much interested in taking over the company and they're both working part-time in the lower jobs to be able to get a feel for the company. The oldest is currently getting his degree while my youngest is working hard in private school. Now my fiance also has two boys from her last marriage who are 20 and 18 and she has never been on good terms with her ex. She was only married to him for about four years and then became a single mother working various jobs and her boys usually stayed with her mom. We got engaged about three years ago and lockdown came and pushed the wedding back. Well, her oldest has been having some disagreements with the law and dropped out of community college and is currently working part-time at a store. And her youngest has been really struggling with school since lockdown and seems to be on something. My oldest son has recently been staying at our guest house for the last three days and has been telling great stories of his uni and how much he enjoys his classes and experience and he can't wait to start working side by side with me. After he went to bed for the night, my fiance pulled me aside and asked if I could create a fund for her boys like I have for mine. I told her no, that I posted bail for her oldest and he doesn't even seem to have a plan for his life. And her youngest said he was never going to college because he hates school and he's going to be a Marine. She got upset with me saying that she wasn't able to provide for them like I have for my boys and they were given different tools for success and it wasn't fair. That they'll be my stepsons and I need to step up to the plate. I told her they're adults now and they're more than welcome to get a job at my company and we can go from there. But she got even more upset and told me I was a jerk for not taking care of them and hasn't talked to me since. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, I don't plan on changing my will until I'm married. Then I'll add my fiance. She has also signed a prenup too. Yes, prenup and will are both ironclad and bulletproof. They've been reviewed countless times by three different attorneys, multiple paralegals, and other workers too. Also, I met her sons for the first time when we were dating for eight months and that was a very quick meet and greet lunch. Her kids lived with their grandma throughout the rest of our relationship and even during our engagement. I've only met them a few other times that I could spare because I was very busy then with work and my own son's lives and then lockdown hit and things just got worse. 
so maybe seeing them six times total, and those were usually just a quick hello or a dinner here and there. I had no part in raising them, just helping on bail because their mom couldn't afford it and the tuition. Her youngest son living with us is the most time I've ever seen him and it's barely been a year at most. Her eldest lived with us for a month or two before she kicked him out. Edit 2. So my fiancé, now life partner slash girlfriend, and I have had a discussion and we are going to couples counseling now and I've made the choice that we are not getting married anymore. We will be life partners but nothing legally binding. She was very upset as she really wanted to be married but she respected my decision. Also, we have also agreed that her son's welfare are her own personal responsibility and I will split the cost with her on half of whatever she wants to help them with financially. She has her own job and doesn't want to leave it. But if they want to work for the company, then that's a different discussion with both parties. Thank you all for your advice. Not the jerk. I ain't saying she a gold digger. But in all seriousness, if they get their crap together, help them with school or with a job in the company, but no need for a trust fund. That free money with no accountability for adults you owe nothing to. This is my thought process too. Helping with the cost of tuition or assisting in obtaining a low-level position is one thing. A trust fund is another. Not the jerk. I wouldn't necessarily say gold digger, but asking a lot for sure. Then getting upset when OP says no made her look even worse. Both of her kids are adults and seem to be behind a bit in life, but a job at the company sounds like a good compromise. OP is reacting and responding appropriately in this situation. Not the jerk. You're not even married yet. Make certain your prenup is valid. She might be a gold digger. Do not count on your kids getting money if she is executor. OP. My sister is my executor, and if something happens to her, then my oldest son is the backup. Well, what do you think? Should OP set up a trust fund for his fiancé's sons or not? Please let us know. Nothing better than free money from a rich guy who marries your mom. I dropped my sister's kids off at a daycare and made her pay for it. I'm 19, female, and my sister, who's 25, asked me to babysit for her. Her kids are 4 and 6, so that she could go to a friend's party. I told her I can't do that today. I had an exam that I had to be at college. I can follow some classes online and have occasionally babysit while listening to lectures. The day for which she needed a babysitter came. I answered the door in the morning and the kids were on my doorstep and my sister was driving off. She just left them with me after I said I couldn't stay home that day. I called a friend that owns a small daycare. She told me I could drop them off there. Thank goodness. I gave her my sister's contact info and told her to keep me updated, and I texted my sister about what happened and gave her the address and the phone number. I picked the kids up from daycare since my sister wasn't answering her phone and fed them. She picked them up at 9pm and was absolutely livid that I left them with a stranger that it was irresponsible, that something could have happened, etc. I told her that she knew I couldn't babysit that day and that she could have picked them up if she wasn't comfortable with that since I texted her the address. She told me I should have just skipped the exam and retaken it later. I thought this was a reasonable thing to do. When someone leaves kids on your doorstep without warning and you can't take care of them, but my parents are on her side. My mom told me my sister already has so much on her plate and that I should help out when I can. I guess babysitting at least one day a week for free isn't good enough. Am I the jerk? Edit. She and her friends went to an escape room or something. It wasn't a regular party. My parents weren't home that day to babysit. And you can retake exams here, but it's a hassle and it means that if I fail, I can't retake it. Just to clear some things up. I'm sorry if this post seemed obvious. Having both my sister and both my parents say that I was in the wrong made me doubt myself. Not the jerk. You should text her. Do not leave your kids on my doorstep unless you've made prior arrangements with me and I have agreed to watch them. The arrangements and consent need to be in writing via text. If you do this again, I will call the authorities instead of a daycare and I will show them that I have made all of this clear to you. I love my nibblings very much, but they are your responsibility. I am not your co-parent. This. Forget your sister and mother for making you feel like her choices are your responsibility whatsoever, not the jerk. Yes, next time drop the kids off at your mother's. If she thinks her sister's actions were fair, she shouldn't have a problem when you do it to her. Their mom went to a party. Bring the kids back to their mom at the party. Hand them to her and drive off. The nerve of that lady. How did she even know OP was still home to take the kids? 
Tell your mother that a party is not a responsibility. Tests, good grades, work, all responsibilities. She knew what she did was wrong. Your sister is lucky. When someone leaves kids on your doorstep without warning after you've explicitly said you couldn't take care of them, you might otherwise call the police or authorities. Tell her this is your other option and you'll do that next time. Oh, and stop watching her kids for her until or unless she learns to respect you. Maybe not even then. I can't get over the part about her just driving off and then not accepting your calls too. What if you were already gone for the day? Now she's left the four and the six year old outside alone for over 12 hours. What was she thinking? Not the jerk times a thousand. I Uno reversed a malicious compliance. This happened years ago when I used to work at an office as a front desk one summer during college. A video I saw today just reminded me of the incident. One day this lady came in to pay a fine. She was very rude and angry about her fine. I don't know the particulars because all I did was work the front desk. She decided to try a little malicious compliance. Her fine was about $250 and she said she was going to be paying in quarters. I knew I had to comply since we're supposed to accept any legal tender. I took the bags from her but realized that she had unrolled every single roll of quarters. She said that since we want to waste her time with a stupid fine, she will also waste our time. I tried to explain and beg her not to do this to me since I had nothing to do with her fine. She didn't care and said that we're all evil. She smirked and said, one band, one sound. I realized that there was no reasoning with her. I was furious, but I began counting one by one. We were interrupted by multiple phone calls and customers, so I had to restart a few times. She started to realize how long this would really take. She tried to stack the quarters to help me count faster, but I told her that it was my job, that I couldn't just take her word for it that the stacks were correct, so I had to do it one by one like she asked for. Two others came, paid, and left while she was still standing there. She started getting mad, saying that I was wasting her time on purpose. I told her that we don't have a coin counter, so this is how long it would take. She threatened to call the police. I told her to go ahead, that I'll have to restart when the police get here so I can be sure to get an accurate count. After someone else came and left, she finally snapped. She whipped out her credit card and paid. As she was leaving, she snatched one of the bags off the counter, but the handle gave way, spilling all the coins all over the floor. She scooped up what she could, but left a good chunk. I told her she was littering and she lost it on me. I got a broom and swept up the coins. There were about 192 quarters on the floor. When I was leaving work, I found some more in the parking lot. It wasn't a whole lot of money, but for a broke college student, it was great. Am I the jerk for telling my boyfriend he ruined our date? I, female 21, and my boyfriend, male 23, of five years, went to our favorite restaurant a few weeks ago. The meal was great and we both really enjoyed ourselves. It was perfect, a completely perfect dinner. I paid the $60 check and we went out to the parking lot to the car. I live in a huge college town along with that Saturday night being a senior ball so the town was busy. We get back to the car and the cars surrounding, it was parked exactly the same as they were when we went in. There were cars to each side of his car along with a truck parallel parked behind him at least two car lengths away. In front of him was the wall of the restaurant and behind him was the roadway in the parking lot, then the parallel parked truck at a distance to clarify. He starts to back out of the space and after a few tries, he says he can't do it. I say instantly I can spot him so he can get out. He says no and that it won't help him because the truck behind him wasn't there when we pulled into the spot and he was scared of hitting it. It was there when we pulled into the spot. He also added he doesn't want others to see me spotting him like he can't handle his vehicle. I say okay, I'll go into the restaurant and find the owner of one of the cars and ask if there was any way they could move it so that he can get out. Didn't want to, but it was the only choice. He says no and kind of flips out, throwing his hat and sunglasses into the dash in frustration and also flooring it as if he's going to hit the building then slamming on the brake before he does. He calls his parents screaming about not being able to get out of the spot and even locked my door when I tried to get out of the vehicle to go get someone else to help spot him. Also, when he is on the phone, the owner of one of the neighboring cars comes outside. I try to tell him that we can talk to her, but he ignored me and kept complaining to his parents how there was no way we were getting out of the spot. The owner of the neighboring car gets in another car and leaves while my boyfriend gets off the phone and says, Yes, we're stuck. 
The screaming and me begging him to just let me spot him continues for 20 minutes and he makes a few jabs that I don't have a license so I wouldn't understand how he feels. At that point, I was really upset and in tears. I had just taken him out to dinner and spent a pretty good amount of money for him to act like this. Finally, he lets me out of the car to spot him and within two minutes, we're out of the spot. Later that night, I told him that he ruined the night and the dinner I paid for for absolutely no reason. I also added that he always has to find a way to destroy any date or thing in general that I want to do just because it's not something he picks. He said what happened was my fault because I should not have spoken to him because it made him feel more frustrated when he was trying to find a solution to the problem. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. Red flags. He locked you in a car because he was mad? This is absurd. Then he gaslights you and says that it's your fault? Get out of here. You even paid. He had one job. Don't be a jerk. He sounds controlling and manipulative. Yeah, your boyfriend was gaslighting. Dump him and find a mature man. Yeah, one that doesn't call mommy because he doesn't know how to drive. I'm very unclear on how his finding a solution involved him calling his mommy and daddy instead of just letting you spot him or just backing the car out however slowly it took him. Like seriously, did he want his parents to drive to the restaurant and do it for him? Not the jerk. Not the jerk. As I was reading this, I was thinking of my ex. He was exactly the same. You'd essentially have to beg him to do anything other than his own plans. Then it's like he'd deliberately sabotage it in some way. He also couldn't handle small frustrations and would completely overreact. He was completely obsessed with appearing like the man, yet was happy to take my money, as he never had any and I did. Yet he gave me pretty much nothing but angst in return. What happened there is terrible. You are absolutely not the jerk. He has a massive issue with his own anger management, self-esteem, and it also seems like he has little to no respect for you. Use this as a waving red flag warning. You are 21 and can still exit this crap show unscathed. I waited till I was 23 and I had bought a house with my ex. I wish I had gone sooner. Never settled to be with someone who treats you like dirt. Am I the jerk for not wanting to teach my boyfriend how to do chores? Just as title says, I'm 20, female, and my boyfriend, 23, male, has always lived at home where his mom did most of the chores. He moved in with me a few weeks ago and asked me to help him learn how to do certain things. It started with cooking. I figured that would be one of the most useful skills for him to know. So every night when I'm cooking, he helped a bit with me explaining why and how I do things. That has been the first two weeks or so. This week, I told him to try himself without help. I found some easy recipes of foods that he likes and left him to try things out. Every single night this week, I've had to do a big part of the cooking because he doesn't know how to cut this, doesn't know how to do this, or it tastes better when you do it. I'm tired of it, and that's just cooking. I've been doing almost all of the other chores myself too. So I told him I'm done, that he'll do his own laundry cook every other day and do the dishes on the days he doesn't cook, that he can ask certain things, but only if he can't find the answer himself and I won't show him or do it for him. He got upset because relationships are about helping each other, but I feel like he doesn't want to learn and just pushes things off onto me. I've shown him how to make French toast twice, but he still claims he doesn't know how to do it. I even wrote down the recipe. I just want him to put in some effort instead of expecting me to do it all. I've talked this over with my mom and she said I should be grateful he's even asking to learn. My boyfriend thinks I don't want to help him with anything. I think he's a grown man and shouldn't need his hand held the entire way, especially with simple stuff. Am I the jerk? Edited. It's not just cooking, it's also things like vacuuming and doing dishes, which is why I don't think it's a lack of confidence or not knowing how to do things. He's seen me vacuum, I've explained how to, he still wants me to show him. Not the jerk. This is weaponized incompetence. OP. Oh, I didn't know there was a term for it. I guess I have some reading to do now. Send him back to his mommy. He's an underbaked cookie. I don't think more time with mommy will help. Quite the opposite, in fact. He needs to live on his own for a while first without taking laundry to mommy's every week. Right now, that's not OP's problem. She just needs to get him out of her house. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. This dude doesn't know how to vacuum? Where did you find him? 
Am I the jerk for telling my sister to stop whispering to her boyfriend during a family movie night? My little sister, who's 20, has been dating this guy, who's 22, for a little over a year now. He became completely blind at the age of 16 after an accident. He's pretty well adjusted to his new way of living by now. Yesterday night, we had a family get-together at our parents' house. Had dinner, played some board games, chatted, things like that. Watching a movie was also on the checklist. We play the movie. Immediately after it started, my sister started describing things to her boyfriend, how the people and environment looked, etc. It annoyed me, 26 female, because even though they were whispering, I could still hear them, and it disturbed my immersion. I kept quiet for a while, but I ended up telling them to please be quiet, because other people like quietness during a movie. They shut up, but after the movie ended, my sister pulled me aside and started calling me names, telling me how that was super rude, that she never thought I'd act like that, etc. I told her that I am in no way inappropriate, but it's annoying to hear constant noise during a movie and this would apply to everyone. She said she won't talk to me anymore unless I apologize to her and her boyfriend. I would, but I don't understand what I did wrong. I believe that when you're hanging out with others, you should be courteous and fit in with the people there. You're the jerk. How else was he supposed to know what was happening in the movie? Your comments for sure probably embarrassed and hurt him even if he has grown accustomed to living without sight. I'm sure he's aware it can be frustrating to others and he's probably more frustrated than anyone else. But him being included is more important than your immersion. It's just a movie. What I'm wondering is, why would they choose activities not suited for blind people if they knew a blind person would attend? Definitely, you're the jerk. I agree with you partially. OP is definitely the jerk. But having a movie night with a blind person there isn't necessarily a bad thing. Plenty of blind people love watching movies. I have many blind family members, including both of my parents, and loads of them enjoy films and TV. I've been to movie night events that have been organized by and for blind people. Many tend to avoid certain film genres. For example, a lot of action movies where the majority of what's going on is visual, or films in foreign languages without dubbing, can be really difficult or impossible to follow. Audio described movies are available too, increasingly so on Netflix and stuff, which is fantastic. It's an audio track that runs alongside the movie and basically does what OP sister was doing. And the quiet moments between dialogue, it will give a description of what the character looks like, how they're moving, facial expressions, what's happening in the background, what the scene looks like, etc. When we hang out, one of my blind friends will run the movie on his phone with audio description turned on and listen to that with one headphone in. We make sure that the film we put on is one he can follow, even if audio description isn't available. Am I the jerk for posting a video of kids stealing from my garage to a neighborhood app? So I recently had some middle school age kids go into my garage and take snacks off of a shelf. For some context, I have four kids who are ages 20, 15, 8, and 5. My oldest daughters usually wait for their younger sisters to get off the school bus. You cannot see the bus stop from our front door because it's set back, so they wait in the garage. The elementary school and middle school release at the same time, so there are multiple buses dropping off various aged kids. This day, my 15-year-old was waiting in the garage and decided to go inside and use the bathroom. At 4.05, three middle school kids approached my garage and two others stood in the street in front of my home. Two of the three boys ran into my garage and ran out about 25 seconds later with snack food and all five kids took off running down the street. My older daughter is seen on the camera about two minutes later and my younger kids get off the school bus at 4.09. I get home from work at 4.12 and my garage is closed. At about 5 o'clock, my husband calls me to ask who the kids in our garage were. I review the camera and notice that the kid who waited outside of my garage lives at the end of my street. I go outside and see that him and one of the kids who entered my garage are playing basketball in the street. I approach them and ask why they were in my garage. The kid who entered my garage said, I wasn't. I told him that it was on my security camera. He said it wasn't him. I reminded him that he was wearing the same clothes. He tells me, call the police then jerk and walks away. I return to the house at the end of my street where the mother is home to speak to her Ask her if her kid can point me in the direction of the homes of the other kids so I can speak to their parents. Her son says he doesn't know who they were and she tells me she can't help me. So I post the video on a neighborhood app asking if anyone knows who the kids are. 
because I would like to speak to their parents. Many people on the app are upset that I posted the video and are saying that I'm starting a witch hunt over snacks. People have commented that I only posted it because they weren't the same color as I am and that I have blown this out of proportion. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If I understand correctly that you only posted on your local neighborhood app, people upset probably know the kids or are related to them. It takes a community to raise a society and middle school kids are old enough to know that this isn't cute or just kids being kids. Am I the jerk for ruining my friend's dinner party because I didn't like the food? Excuse my English as it's not my first language. Some backstory. I, male 27, am a picky eater. Always have been. Maybe due to my clinically diagnosed ADHD. Growing up, my mom did her best to cater for my needs. I like a lot of her things, but I hate some textures and some methods of cooking. So since I was 13, she taught me how to cook for myself. And at 16, I was fully independent when it came to food. Now to the main issue. My friend, 26, male, let's call him C, is dating this girl for about six years now. She is a chef and C is boastful about her culinary skills and always says she can make a picky eater like you eat everything. I saw what she usually makes and it does look nice, but my problem boils down to texture issues. Last week, C had the brilliant idea to invite me and my significant other plus two other couples to his dinner party at their house. I immediately shut down the invitation because I knew how it would end. He insisted, but I assured him that I would be uncomfortable and he would put me in a tough spot. He didn't seem to budge, so I obliged. But first, I told him that if I didn't like the food, it would be his problem to deal with. Two days ago, the day of the party happened. We arrived earlier. I asked first thing for what they were going to serve, but the girlfriend, the chef, told me it would be best to keep it a surprise. I had a terrible gut feeling, but my wife said it would be all right. Cue to the actual party. The entries were good. The main dish was painful to get through because it had a lot of caramelized onion, but the dessert was catastrophic. It had some weird odor and taste to it, some fruit I didn't recognize, and the first spoon made me gag, so I excused myself to the bathroom. When I got back after five minutes, the chef was crying and my wife was consoling her. Apparently, my reaction offended her. I immediately apologized without thinking much, but C said the party was over. When we got home, my wife said I should have powdered through it and shouldn't have embarrassed her. I said sorry, but that was a reflex and I couldn't control it. We didn't talk much about it after that. Yesterday, I met my friend again, we're also co-workers, and he told me that I am the jerk for how I acted and I should stop acting like a kid. I told him that I wouldn't force myself to change to please others. I have no problem apologizing and putting the issue behind us, but I don't feel like it would be genuine because I don't feel like I was in the wrong. So am I the jerk here and do I have to try to change? What is the best course of action? Edit for things I want to add and clarify. 1. My parents never enabled my behavior. They helped me to like the majority of dishes, but some of them were lost causes. 2. I'm now aware that my case is special and I should have held my stance and next time there's a similar situation, I will be more careful on how to react and be mindful of my conduct. 3. I don't know the extent the chef knew about my palate. 4. I will ask both my friend and his girlfriend to meet together to clear the air because, in hindsight, my reaction was not the appropriate one and I hope she would understand that her cooking was not the problem. Not the jerk. You made it clear you have some texture issues with food. You can't help your reactions. That's like blaming someone for a sneeze. If anything, you're owed an apology for forcing you into an awkward situation. You apologized, which was kind, for upsetting the hostess. Your significant other and friends are rude jerks to demand you change how you process the world. Not the jerk. A chef that really wanted to impress a picky eater would have asked what flavors and textures you prefer. Maybe I'm sensitive because I have picky eaters in my family, but I know most people can't control their gag reflex. It's unfortunate, but not deliberately cruel. You do have the option of not eating with them again. It may now be your only option, and that's probably for the best. Sorry, but I have to disagree and will probably be downvoted into oblivion, but you're the jerk. What a respectful, courteous adult would have done is to politely decline dessert if you thought you may have issues with it. People decline dessert all the time. You only needed to say something to the effect that you are absolutely stuffed after the delicious dinner and had no room for dessert, but it looks fabulous and then change the topic. This is what a polite and respectful adult guest does 
Instead, you made it all about you and your food issues and probably made the chef feel absolutely terrible. Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk or not? Please let us know. I actually got hungry when we read about the caramelized onions. Mm, yes. Please tip your own server. This was Valentine's Day a few years ago, and I still think about it. It was a higher-end Italian place, and we were always booked on Valentine's Day. We are a bring-your-own-beer place also, which will come into play. We had a guy come in with his girlfriend. The guy was familiar because he worked in the law office near us, and he would get lunch at takeout. I was serving him, and he said he forgot a bottle of wine and asked if we had any. We had leftovers from a banquet party, so I said I could make something work for you. I went to get it. My coworker Shane overheard, so he got the bottle for me to save time since we were all so busy and gave it to me near our table. I thanked him, went to my table, and gave it to the customer. They said thank you. The bottle of wine was on the house. At the end of the night, I ask how everything was, and the guy asks how he can tip Shane out instead of me since he got him the bottle of wine. I don't think he understood why it took a few seconds to respond. Yes, Shane handed me the bottle of wine, but at the end of the day, I was your server that was giving you the free bottle. My other servers were so upset on my behalf, they have never heard anything like that and thought it was demeaning. I think the guy's girlfriend was confused too. Shane told me I should have told him to tip me extra on my card and I would give it to Shane, but Shane would have expected me to keep it all. Would love to know if anything like this has ever happened to anyone else. Very weird. Would I be the jerk for having a Star Wars themed wedding? My fiance, 26 female, and I, 27 male, recently got engaged on Valentine's Day 2021. We're hoping to get married in the next two years, so almost every conversation we have at the moment is about wedding planning. Star Wars has been a huge influence on my life ever since I was a kid. I've watched all the movies more times than I could possibly count, and it's something nearly all of my family and friends enjoy too. So when I was thinking of wedding planning ideas, it seemed obvious that we should be doing something Star Wars related. I've been brainstorming ideas, and I have some really great themed ideas. For example, blue milk drinks to serve our guests, hiring stormtroopers to party and dance, Jedi robes for all of my groomsmen, playing across the stars for the first dance. While I have more typically nerdy interests, my fiance isn't really interested in most movies or games. She's very much a typical girly girl and the type of person who has been planning her wedding since she was very young. She has some very specific ideas about what our wedding should look like, much more formal and glamorous than I'd imagined, and her vision definitely doesn't include lightsabers. The problem is that my fiancé really doesn't want anything Star Wars related at our wedding at all. All of my suggestions so far have been shot down without further discussion. One solution I suggested was that we could plan half the wedding, like she handles the ceremony and I plan the reception. That way, we could both have what we want. However, my fiancé says that plan would make me the jerk because even having a Star Wars themed reception would be an embarrassment in front of everyone we know. From my perspective, this is my wedding too, and I should get to decide at least half of the day. While money isn't much of an issue, we share finances, so I'm paying enough to get a say too. Am I the jerk for wanting a Star Wars themed wedding, even though my fiancé really doesn't? Karen tries to force me to make my son wear a helmet, even though he's old enough to make that decision himself. I'm 42, male, and my son, who's 15, is a good kid and he loves to skateboard. He's actually pretty talented and is even sponsored by the local skate shop. He skated since he was 7. Until he was 13 or so, I always made him wear a helmet. He started resisting wearing a helmet around then, and while I would prefer that he does wear one, I know I can't control every aspect of his life. By that point, his body had learned how to fall correctly when he messed up on a trick. I used to skate back in the day. If you skateboard, you know what I mean. So I made a compromise with him. If he's just out street skating with his friends, he doesn't need to wear one. But if he's at a park that requires it, or is skating at a bowl or a half pipe, or if he's otherwise attempting something dangerous for the first time, then he needs to wear one. He readily agreed and has been good about wearing a helmet in those circumstances. Anyway, a couple weeks ago, my wife, who's 41, was running an errand the other day, and she saw our son out skateboarding, doing tricks down a small five-stair set, and he wasn't wearing a helmet. She flipped out, pulled over, yelled at him in front of his friends, and made him come home. Now, it's not that my wife didn't know about my helmet rules, but in her view, what he was doing qualified as dangerous. 
He can ollie down stair sets almost three times that size. She's never really loved that he's been into skateboarding. She always wanted him to do team sports, and as such, I don't think she fully appreciates how good he is for his age, nor does she understand that he knows what his limits are and what he's doing. She's now insisting that he wear a helmet at all times, much to my son's chagrin. I pointed out to her, privately, that this is ridiculous. He's at an age where he can make this choice himself, and on top of that, our daughter, who's 14, who does cheer and gymnastics and doesn't have to wear a helmet, despite head injuries being fairly common in those sports. To make my point, I got one of those cheerleader helmets and declared that she now needs to wear a helmet too since her brother has to. Our daughter is kind of a weirdo and to her credit thinks this is all pretty funny and said something like, I will be known as the helmet queen and started wearing it at practice. My wife is now freaking out because she doesn't want our daughter to stick out at games or competitions and make people think that she's special. Yes, seriously, she said that. My wife is saying I'm both undermining her and encouraging our son to do dangerous things and that our daughter is going to get bullied for wearing a helmet. So, am I the jerk? You're the jerk. You're too concerned with being the cool parent. Everyone wears helmets, even Olympic athletes. Aside from safety, he could lose his sponsorship. Nobody wants their brand tied to a gross negligence and poor role models. Even Tony Hawk wears one. Yeah, I was going to say that. Every video I remember seeing of Tony Hawk, he has a helmet on. He doesn't always have pads on, but he always wears a helmet. I think OP needs to make a distinction of when protection is needed. If he's just cruising around and using it as transportation, he's probably fine. If he's jumping down flights of stairs, he probably needs a helmet. Not necessarily from his own skill level, but from possible interference from the outside world, errant cyclists, or oblivious people walking around. You said your daughter is kind of a weirdo and to her credit thinks it's all pretty funny. Actually, your daughter sounds like the only sensible one among the four of you. She's comfortable enough with herself to know wearing a safety device isn't going to affect her socially in the long run and knows how to embrace change. Frankly, I'm surprised at how level-headed she is when the three of y'all seem to be equally stubborn. While your son needs a crash course and why his safety comes before his looks, and your wife needs to chill out about worrying that your daughter is going to look different, you are by far the biggest jerk of the group for your blatant disregard for your son's physical safety and dragging your daughter into your argument with your wife. You're the jerk. Also, your daughter is hilarious. You're the jerk. I'm a nurse, and the one time I wasn't home to make him wear a helmet, he crashed his skateboard and was injured. Head injuries can be serious and are preventable with a helmet. Again, you're the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Public service announcement, always wear a helmet. Parents told me that spending long amounts of time with any of their adult kids is bad for their marriage. I, 26 male, was recently told by my parents, who are in their late 50s, that I wouldn't be able to live with them for more than a night, even if I lost my job, because it's bad for their marriage. My sister, who's 29, has a chronic illness that forces her to visit my parents for about one week at a time to see a specialist in our home city. My parents told me that even my sister spending a week with them is bad for their marriage and they have to put an end to it. This whole conversation started because there might be a lapse in my lease and I might not have a place to live for a few weeks in June. I own a travel trailer, so they said I could live in that at a campground before my new lease starts. I was shocked that even if push came to shove, I wouldn't be able to land at their place for a short while. Two years ago when lockdown hit, my girlfriend, 24 female, and I were displaced. We crashed at a friend's place for two months because my parents, who literally own two houses, wouldn't allow us to stay at either. My mom told me then, we would always let you stay with us, but we just can't house your partner as well. She's a taker. Uh, okay, whatever. My mom was newly sober, so I didn't think much of it. Well, two years later, here we are, and I am in fact not allowed to stay with them. I quoted my mom back to her. She called me manipulative. My dad shouted at me, and they both told me, a lot has changed in the last two years. We are doing a lot better, and living with you is bad for our marriage. We can't live with you at all anymore, unless you become very sick or are in severe debt. Well, guess they're going straight to the nursing home if they live long enough. More context, my mom drinks too much, and she's been sober for two and a half years. My parents have seen the same therapist since, which seems fishy. 
Mother went from aggressively pushing meds on the whole family for years to staunchly hating all meds. End rant. Crap like this makes me so grateful for the family I'm building with my girlfriend. No plans on having kids though. Well, in their old age, you can tell them they can't live with you because it would be bad for your marriage. Just make sure you remind them why they are getting the cheapest old folks home available in the worst area of your city. I can relate to this and it really hurts. My parents are divorced and I moved out of state several years ago. After about one and a half years of not getting to see either of them, I planned a trip to visit my mom and contact my dad and asked if he'd be up for a visit one of the weekends I was in town. He said yes and he picked me up from my mom's. I had flown in, so no car. I thought we had a good weekend together, but after I left, he sent me an email saying he had the worst weekend ever and how I made him so uncomfortable by doing rude things. His examples were that I asked for his Wi-Fi password and that I offered to drive his car to pick up takeout we had ordered. In his mind, I was trying to hack his internet and steal his car. I literally have no idea where this came from. In the email, he said that he likes his privacy and that I'm not welcome in his home overnight. He went on to say that he's looking forward to the day my youngest sibling turns 18 so he will never have to have any of his five kids stay in his home again. I was shocked, sad, uncomfortable, you name it. About a year later, I called him to let him know that I was pregnant and he was going to be a grandpa. He acted happy and then completely ghosted me. It's been two years since I heard from him. I have no idea what happened, but he also had an unhealthy and overstepping relationship with his counselor. I think that played a part. My entitled mother tries stealing my inheritance. She ends up in major debt. I'm 22, male. I have a mother who's 54 and used to have a father, 57, and I also used to have a sister, 29, but both my father and sister sadly passed in an accident a few months ago. I was out of town, so I didn't know until my mom called me. I was horrified and immediately took a train to see her. It was mostly just both of us crying and grieving, but a week after that and a day before the funeral, we went to go see my dad's lawyer and discuss the will. It turns out the assets were all split 50-50 with my sister, but I ended up with more of the money because my dad gave the house to her. The house was only under my dad's name, so he could give all of it to whoever he wanted. Now, since my sister is gone and I ended up with everything including the house, now let me tell you, my dad was a good investor and businessman, so he was what you could say wealthy, so I got a lot. I was planning on giving the house to my mom and around 30% of the money, but when we got in the car, before I could even say anything, she started talking. The following conversation went like this. My mom, OP, you need to just give the house to me. It's mine. I live in it and you aren't going to need it. It should have gone to me anyways. Also, he was my husband and I deserve half of the money you got. I don't know why you would have got anything anyways, but that money was your sister's and now it should be mine. Me. It doesn't matter if you deserve it or if it was my sister's and now it should be yours. It's my money and I can do whatever I want with it. My mom. I know, but I'm your mother and you should give it to me. Me. Can we talk about this after the funeral, please? She said okay. Then we went on with the funeral, but afterwards she didn't waste any time and demanded the house and half the money as soon as we got home. I told her straight up, no, I was gonna give it to you and 30% of the money, but I don't want to anymore because you're acting like you're entitled to that money. She started screaming at me, saying that after everything she's done for me, I won't give her the money that is rightfully hers, and then she threatened to sue me. I told her go ahead since now I have the money for it and she doesn't have that much, and surprisingly, she did. I got a letter in the mail telling me this. I immediately got a lawyer, and he said he would take care of it, and he did. I won the court battle, and my mom didn't get a cent, and actually got in debt for the lawyer fees, which wasn't much since she lost, but was more than she could afford. During this time, I actually got very depressed since I realized my mom never actually loved my dad, or at least I don't think. She only loved his money, and since my dad and sister were both gone, also, while I was growing up, I was my mom's favorite kid, and I would talk to her all the time, so it was really tough after this not talking to her since I still loved her. Also, I ended up letting her live in the house, but she paid the bills and everything, and I still own it. Let me know if you think I should give her any money, or if I'm a jerk. I want to hear your opinions. Please don't give her any money. She has proven that the only thing she cares about is the money. Not you, not your dad, and not your sister. 
If you give her money, she will continue to need more until she gets all out of it, and then you will both be broke and unhappy. Your dad knew what he was doing when he didn't leave anything to her. He knew she would squander it. That money is for you to have a happy, healthy life. It was bad enough the way she demanded the house and half the money. Then she threatened to sue you for it and actually followed through. She's lucky you're letting her live in the house after all that. I don't think you should give her any money, to be honest. Honestly, OP says some really weird stuff here. Somehow, him doing chores as a teen is supposed to prove to us that his stay-at-home mom didn't really work that much and therefore didn't really deserve his father's money? His replies to other commenters quite clearly indicate he doesn't think much of her at all. All those trying to justify his actions and saying, yeah, but too many chores becomes parentification. Did OP say he had to do too many chores? Y'all are really reaching. In fact, OP himself says he had a good relationship with his mom and chores are normal. In fact, she's an amazing mother if she made her son do chores and learn responsibility and he's completely clueless to the effort she's put into the marriage and the kids. In one reply, he says she only had to cook. Do you know how much cooks are paid, OP? Do you know what they're worth? Even if that's all she did, isn't that hard work for years on end? You expect us to believe that either your father raised you and your sister completely and mom was just a prop in the corner, or that she was an absentee or a bad mom? And I still don't understand how OP's father could will away everything legally with a wife in the picture. Just doesn't make sense. With the information we've been given, it sounds like his mom freaked out. I'm sure it wasn't one tiny conversation where she said, give me X and Y, and OP said, let's talk later about this, and she said, give me X and Y later, and OP said, you are being entitled, I won't give you anything, and next day she sued. There's stuff we're not being told, and this story sounds super one-sided, especially with the added comments from OP about his mom. So, you're the jerk, OP, and mom's a mild jerk for being rude and entitled. I would lose it too if I gave my life to my husband and kids and one day the rug is pulled from beneath my feet and those I loved and cared for for years suddenly don't care about me or my happiness, my safety and everything I gave up for them. The worst thing I did was speak rudely with the poor timing because I was scared and this is what I get in return for my son and husband? Perhaps I'm taking this personally, but this ladies is why you should always have a means of income, always. Not saying OP is completely at fault or that his mom is blameless, I just don't think this is as simple as it's written here. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his mom? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to read the comments we get about this. Should I give up my home office for my stepdaughter? I, 41 female, have been living with my boyfriend Matt, 40 male, for two years, together for four. Matt has a daughter, Phoebe, who's seven, who lives with her mom, literally around the corner. That's maybe a three minute walk between our houses, so Phoebe spends a lot of time at ours, but always sleeps over at her mom's. However, Phoebe's mom is moving to a bigger house because she's expecting another baby. This means Phoebe will be about 30 minutes away, so we'll be spending the nights with us. We have what's technically a two bedroom house, but one of those bedrooms is my study. I work from home in a job with high data security requirements. Matt wants me to give up my study so Phoebe can have a bedroom. While I would technically put a bed in my study and share it with Phoebe, it would make it harder for me to work and would mean she couldn't be in her bedroom during working hours. I've suggested that either we move to a three-bedroom house or look at converting our attic into a bedroom. Either of these options would involve borrowing money and Matt has a near phobia of debt due to his chaotic childhood. I own our current house outright, having inherited it from my grandma before I met Matt. I don't charge him rent, we split utilities and groceries proportionate to income. I cover all maintenance costs, but he helps out with the labor. He says I'm being selfish and putting myself before Phoebe. I say he's being selfish for the same reason. Update. Wow, it's amazing how people have misread our relationship. First, Matt is not a freeloading loser. He works close to full time as a pediatrics nurse, slightly reduced hours so he can care for Phoebe after school supported us for a while or so while I was getting my business off the ground and does most of the housework. Frankly, he's a gym and I'm lucky to have him. We sat down and had a less fraught discussion about things. He's panicking about Phoebe moving away and the impact it will have on his relationship with her. He also hasn't realized how much money my business is bringing in now and thought I was being foolish with the amount of money I was throwing around on holidays, etc. The thought of adding a hefty debt on top of the panic about Phoebe had him overreacting. 
We've gone over the figures and worked out that there's a good chance I can pay for the loft conversion without having to take out a loan. If we just get professionals in for the structural side of things and do the rest of the work ourselves, we're going to get a couple of quotes and see how the numbers play out. But this is looking very likely with my office being in the loft. And for people telling me Phoebe isn't my stepdaughter, maybe not legally, but she is in every way that counts. Not the jerk. Man, I was prepared to yell at you until I learned you're willing to move to give your stepdaughter a bedroom. You aren't selfish. You're very accommodating, actually. Your husband needs to address his debt trauma and get good with buying a bigger home. Your family has needs for a larger home, plain and simple. Whoops, editing to add, you aren't married. My brain rewrote a little bit of your life story. Apologies. And to be honest, I don't think you should move. I think you should convert your attic and keep letting your house increase in value right now. Same. Was totally prepared to go off on OP, but no, she's the sane one. She even had offered to move from her totally paid off home. OP, your boyfriend is a mooch who is now asking for even more of your home for free. If it doesn't work for him, maybe he needs to find his own place. He's saving a heck of a lot of money by not paying rent. His mooching self can pay for an attic conversion. What is he doing with his money? Is he hoarding it whilst OP pays for him and kiddo to live at her owned home? Sorry, but half utilities and groceries doesn't cut it. His kiddo is there and now spending nights? He needs to pay more. Why should OP be paying for his kid? He is being entirely unreasonable. Am I the jerk for not tying my girlfriend's shoelaces? I'm 24, male. My girlfriend, who's also 24, broke her hand recently. We had dinner with some of my friends last night. She insisted on wearing shoes with laces. I asked her how she planned on tying her shoelaces if they got untied. She said she'd make me tie them. I told her I wouldn't and that she'd end up breaking her other hand. I'm guessing she thought I was joking because her shoelaces did get untied when we were out with my friends and she told me to tie them. I laughed in her face and told her to tie them herself. She stared at me angrily like I did something wrong by refusing to tie her stupid shoelaces that I warned her about. I avoided her for the rest of the night. I noticed her shoelaces were tied on the way home, so she probably made some poor guy tie them for her. She slept on the couch last night and won't talk to me. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Why are you with someone you clearly don't like or care about? When I was pregnant, my husband refused to let me struggle with my shoes. He always helped me. After I gave birth, like months later, I was having a back issue and asked him to help me with my shoes. He was kneeling down and looked up at me and said, you know, I really miss helping you with your shoes. I was like, who are you? He loved me and wanted to help me however he could. OP clearly doesn't give a darn about his girlfriend. I don't have a broken hand. But when we go skiing, my boyfriend puts on my boots and takes them off for me because he knows I'm new to it and it takes me a long time to figure it out. Does he have to? Absolutely not. He does it on his own and without me ever asking because he loves me and wants to make my life easier. OP's girlfriend has a broken hand and literally can't do it on her own. I hope she dumps OP because she deserves so much better. Some people seriously can't grasp the concept of empathy. My ex broke her leg really badly when we were together. Six months bed rest and another six before it was weight bearing. She was sent home from the hospital with meds and had to take two every four hours. I couldn't sleep in the bed with her because I move in my sleep and couldn't risk hitting her busted leg and still had to sleep in the same room to wake up and give her meds. Solution was a little foam camping mattress next to the bed on the floor so I could be nearby if she needed something. My brother was visiting and saw it and asked if that was where the dog slept. I told him that it was for me and he thought it was the funniest thing. He told everyone that my girlfriend made me sleep on a dog bed on the floor and how degrading that was for me. He literally could not grasp that I would choose to be slightly uncomfortable to provide some level of comfort to someone else. Another time we were at my parents' house and it was a full house, no seating room. He was lying on a lounger chair and made his girlfriend sit on the floor instead of giving it up or sharing it. There are people like this in the world. She finna leave you for the guy who tied her shoes. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for refusing to take 50% custody after my kids left themselves? I know the title makes me sound like a jerk, but hear me out. I, 35 female, have three kids with my ex-boyfriend, who's 37. We had 50-50 custody since our last daughter, seven years of age. June of 2021, he asked for 100% custody, and of course, I refused. He threatened me saying he would get it. 
That Sunday, when I got them for my week, my kids were angry and accused me of taking them. The whole week, they were too much, so I gave him 100% custody while agreeing to pay child support. It was summer, so of course they were having lots of fun, and since his new girlfriend couldn't have kids, it was like a perfect situation for them. Well, I moved out of the house, got an apartment where I could easily pay rent, and began living my best life. It got kind of lonely, but I reminded myself it was just me and I was free to do anything I want. Well, once school started, problems rose at their house. He didn't know what to do when it came to school as I covered all of it. I gave him a binder with everything he would need to do. Well, since January, the kids and my ex have been begging to go back to 50-50 and I've refused every time. His reasons are, one, they can't have bedtime with them in the house, two, working with the school for grades is too complicated, three, he can't discipline them, four, they expect an allowance, five, he's sorry for threatening me. I still refused and told them they made their choice. Well, he told my family and I'm getting messages from everyone for not taking the kids back. So, am I the jerk? Edit. A lot of you think I should see them on weekends and try to rebuild the relationship before going back to 50-50. I think I will try this, and thank you to the others who said I was the jerk and have a good reason why. I will be putting my kids first from now on. Everyone sucks here. Neither of the parents seem to be very concerned about what's in the best interest of the kids, only what's convenient or inconvenient to themselves. Right? One of those kids is 7 years old and didn't want to be with mom so she just gave up custody, moved, and started a new life? It sounds like a really bad joke that an overtired mom would tell, but never seriously consider. It also sounds like the dad was fun dad and never helped with schoolwork or enforced bedtimes. He's only there for the fun stuff and is finding out the hard way that that's not going to cut it. I seriously feel so bad for those kids. Both parents try to give them up as soon as things get hard. That's going to have lasting effects. Seems no surprise to me that they're acting out either. With so much animosity between the parents, those kids must have minimal sense of security or stability. You can't limit parenting your kids to the times when they're well behaved. If anything, it's when they're misbehaving and lashing out that they need you more. The ex 100% created this situation. Why is everyone blaming the mom? A protracted and contentious custody battle would have been way worse on the kids. If the mom takes the kids back at this age, the ex will pull this crap again and again. As easy as it was to get mom out of the picture, it needs to be 10x as hard to get her to come back. Lawyer, family therapy, written agreements filed with the court. It's the only way to keep it from happening again. I don't think OP wanted to give up the kids. Her ex had successfully turned the kids against her. It's not the kids' fault, but at some point you have to cut your losses. If you broke your hand, you can't be hitting it against the wall. You have to let your hand heal. It's the same for a broken heart. She didn't give up on them when it got hard. She gave them what they wanted. Her ex is trying to give up when it gets hard. He probably just wanted the kids so it would hurt her. It worked. He hurt her and he hurt them. She upholds her responsibility. She pays child support. That is what everyone agreed on. She moved on to a different living situation since she no longer had the kids so it's not as easy as just taking the kids again 50% of the time. Her ex made his bed so he knows what he has to do now. I don't think OP is a jerk. I think OP did what her ex and the kids wanted. She pays child support and that is the extent of her responsibilities now. It's easy to make the mother out to be the jerk, but none of us know what she went through. In my case, I asked my ex to take the kids because I could not get good childcare for them working double shifts to pay the bills. You know what the lawyer put in the papers for me to sign? That I was an unfit mother that is never at home. Edit because according to him, I was too busy whirling around in bars at night and that the kids would be better off staying with their cheating father. I set that straight real quick. The reason why I'm not at home is because I work double shifts in nursing homes, cleaning old people because their families don't care most of the time. I had to change that real quick because I told him and ex both that I can get a lawyer and plenty of witnesses that will testify on my behalf and ruin his life. So stop making assumptions about this woman and what kind of a mother she is. Am I the jerk for showing my boyfriend the doctor's note saying I need a responsible adult with me for the first 12 hours after surgery? I, 32 female, had dental surgery done on Friday where I was sedated. I can only eat soft food for the next two weeks, can't really talk and have stitches on both sides of the roof of my mouth and on both my upper and lower teeth on the right side. The surgeon was very clear that I was not allowed to drive myself to the appointment and a taxi or Uber was not appropriate 
as the sedation would require a responsible adult to supervise me for the day following my surgery. Four months ago, I asked my boyfriend, 32 male, of 15 years to schedule this day off work to help me as I don't have any family in town who could assist. The day before the appointment, he told me that he had booked a job at work, he's a mechanic, and would have to go in for part of the day. I reminded him about needing someone to help take care of me and he said he would try to get everything done while they were performing the surgery. The day of the surgery came and he dropped me off and then he went to work. When I came out of surgery, he was agitated saying that he had been waiting for an hour for me to finish. I apologized. Before we left, the doctor told him he would have to go to the pharmacy on the way home to pick up my pain meds. When we got to the pharmacy, nothing was ready and we were told we would have to come back in an hour and a half. He brought me home and then left, saying that if I needed something to call him. I cried and begged him to stay to help me, but he said he had to go because the customer really needed their car and he didn't want to give away the work to another mechanic because then he wouldn't make the money. As background information, he's paid per job and usually makes between 65 to 80 hours each week. Four hours later, he returned with the pain meds. By this point, I was in tears and having a complete meltdown because of the pain, the sedation, and trying to take care of our dog. When he got there, our dog was barking and whining to go for a walk. I asked him if he could please take her while I try to eat something so I can take the pills, and he again said he was busy and had to go back to work. When he got home that night at 7, surgery finished at 11 a.m., I asked him to please read over the instructions. He got very angry and said I was deliberately trying to make him feel bad by asking him to read the part about having a responsible adult at home with me for the first 12 hours. It is now Sunday and he is still furious with me. He said I was unreasonable and that if he works in town and it only takes him 20 minutes to come home, there was no reason for him to stay at home with me. He's refused to do anything to help this weekend and has instead spent the entire weekend playing video games, watching TikTok videos and napping. He won't even sleep in our bed and he told me today that I better find someone else to help me when I get my second surgery on the other half of my mouth because he's not doing it. Am I the jerk here for expecting him to take care of me? Not the jerk. Sweetie, he isn't a good boyfriend. He said he would help, then suddenly couldn't. He still won't help and expects you to soldier on like you aren't in pain. This shows he is selfish. If he absolutely couldn't get the day off, he should have told you. But he didn't even give you a chance to find someone else. He is right. Find someone else for the surgery, like a new boyfriend. He has to go. My long-term partner would never let me cry in pain like this and go play video games. You deserve so much better. Or even a good person. Why would you let someone suffer for four hours without pain meds? Why won't he believe you when you tell him what the doctor's instructions are? This. My ex and I were at the very beginning of our separation when I had dental surgery and he still took me and took care of me after. People suck. Not the jerk, but you misread the instructions. They said, responsible adult. Your boyfriend seems to be overwhelmed with any responsibility outside of fixing cars. Hope you have a responsible adult to call on. He is not it. Am I the jerk for telling my husband I was tired of babysitting? This weekend, my, 34 female, husband, 38 male, last minute invited two of his friends, both males late 30s, over to hang out. I always enjoy hanging out with these friends. They usually bring their partners, but this time did not. They did each bring their kids, and one of them brought their three dogs. My kids enjoyed playing with their kids, so it was all good. Approximately 10 minutes after everyone arrived at our house, the men went upstairs to play PlayStation, leaving me responsible for supervising and caring for five kids, ages 10, 10, 7, 7, and 5, and three dogs for five plus hours. Two of the kids are mine. This was not discussed beforehand, and if I had not been here, they would not have left the kids downstairs or outside unsupervised. The kids were mostly well behaved and only broke a few things and got in a few fights. After about four hours, my husband came downstairs and asked me how it was going, and I told him I was tired of babysitting, and it's not how I thought our hangout day would go. He got very upset. He said he never invites friends over to do this, which is true, they have never gone upstairs to play video games for hours while I watch their kids and he felt like I was only thinking of myself. Now I feel like a jerk, and I feel like I should have just let him have his fun afternoon and evening with his friends. Not the jerk. Your husband's friends didn't need to bring their dogs and kids to play video games. The dogs and kids could have been left at their respective homes. Their wives were tired of always being stuck with the kids too. 
I bet those wives thought their husbands were having a dad and kids day. I doubt they'd be pleased to find out hubby foisted them off to OP. Not the jerk. He should have asked you beforehand if he could have a special day with his friends and if you would agree to babysit their kids and dogs. To simply impose it on you is rude and disrespectful and he owes you an apology. Karen Mother demands the password to my safe. My uncle and my mom have been arguing over this and I feel terrible. I don't know what to think. So my mom let me get anything under $25 for Easter, given it's on Amazon. I got a small mini ATM of sorts. It has a four digit passcode and makes noise when someone attempts to open it and even louder if you fail. Plus, it automatically sucks in your money, like an ATM would. I had been looking at this for a while, saving up my allowance and planning to get it. Since it was under the price range, I asked and she got it for me. It came in yesterday and I put the batteries in, set the code and already put the money I had in it. I get a $10 allowance and if I do certain tasks, I get an extra $10 to $20, which is only about $10 right now. My mom asked for the password, which frankly I thought was a joke, so I told her a fake one. I just thought it was her messing with me and trying to get me to laugh. She came home today and did her inspection of my room. I've been spending the past few days working on the rest of the house, so I haven't gotten a chance to do it. I didn't think she would try anything, so I continued making myself some sandwiches for a late brunch. It was 10 a.m., I couldn't care less. Then I heard the noise it made when you failed the passcode. I tested it night prior just in case and rushed to my room. What I see is my mom trying to get into it, then turned to me and glared. You told me the password was 1234. Why isn't it working? I was confused and taken back. Like, who expects this from their mom? I got upset as well and yelled at her to get out of my room and walk away from my money. She left in a huff and when my uncle came home, he got his ear talked off, practically yelled at for it. He says I shouldn't have lied, but I didn't have to give her the passcode. Now the two are arguing and I feel really bad for causing it. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk at all. Your mother is angry with you because she couldn't break into what amounts to your piggy bank and steal your allowance. That's some next level jerk behavior. OP. She wouldn't even be stealing it back. It's my uncle who pays me and started my whole allowance anyways, not her. So not stealing it back, just stealing it. Kid, you gobsmacked me. My jaw just hit the desk. There are no words I can actually say that won't get me thrown off of this sub except your mother is queen of the jerks. May no one ever rise to take her place. It doesn't get lower than stealing money from your kid that other people have given them for their own daily spending. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you give your mom the passcode to your safe or not? Please let us know. I think we need to set a booby trap for next time she tries it. Have you ever seen Goonies? Entitled mom tries taking my necklace, gets kicked out of the doctor's office. For some context, since last year, I've been sick. At first, we thought I'd need surgery. However, the doctor wanted to check something out first and sent me to another doctor. After a couple months of testing, this was the last one I needed. I also had messed up my leg during this time and it made it extremely hard to walk on my own. My doctor had suggested I buy a cane, which I did. Another thing about me, while I'm an adult, I have an extreme baby face syndrome. People have thought that I was an eighth grader while I'm a freshman in college. My height of five feet doesn't help that either. Now with context, let's get on to the story. We've got me, Peach. We've got the nice boy, we've got entitled mother, and we've got the security guard. I'm sitting in the doctor's office, waiting for me to get called back. The doctor's office was absolutely packed, so it took a while for me to get called back. After five minutes of waiting, a seven-year-old boy and a mom walk in and check in. Both sit down in front of me, and I don't really think anything of it. I move my cane more towards me in order to avoid them tripping and look at the TV as I wait. After a couple minutes, I hear a small voice speak. Excuse me. I look down from the TV and see the boy across from me looking at me. Me. Yes? Can I help you? Nice boy. How come you have a cane? The mother looks up from her phone and looks at me, then him. Karen. Don't ask people those questions. Me. Oh, it's okay. I don't mind people asking. I had an injury and the cane helps me walk. Nice boy. Does it hurt when you walk? Me. Sometimes, but the cane helps. I know kids tend to be naturally curious, so I didn't take his comments as rude. After he asked, we started talking about how our days were, our age, and eventually got to talking about the birds. 
The kid was an absolute encyclopedia about birds and told me a lot of facts about birds. One of my favorite he told me is that a toucan's skin is actually more translucent, which is crazy. Nice boy noticed my necklace, which is a metal raven, and said, Wow, I like your necklace. Is it a raven or a crow skull? Me. It's a raven skull. You know a lot about birds. That's really awesome. Yeah, I really like... Entitled mom cut him off. Excuse me? I looked to her. She had this look of pure hate and disgust. Me. Yes? Is there something wrong? Karen. Why are you wearing a skull around your neck? That's kind of inappropriate, don't you think? Me. No, it's just a metal raven skull. Nothing inappropriate about it. It's kind of evil, isn't it? What? Her saying that blew me out of the water. And what world is wearing something like a metal bird skull evil? Me. Ma'am, it's just a necklace. It's nice. I liked it. I bought it. Karen. You really need to take it off. You're going to corrupt my son. We are Christian. Looking over to the kid, he looked as dumbfounded as I was. The boy. Mama, it's just a necklace. Be quiet. Then she tells me. You need to take that off right now and give it to me. Also, you look too young to be using a cane. You're just wanting attention. Me, taking none of her BS. Ma'am, I'm not giving you my necklace or my cane. And if anything, you're the one wanting attention and you're ignorant for thinking that just because my necklace has a bird skull on it that it's evil. Also for thinking young people can't have a cane just because they're young. Young people use things such as canes and walkers all the time. How dare you talk back to me? At this point, she got up and tried to grab my cane and necklace. I was ready to push her back, but the security guard who was coming inside for some water stepped in between Entitled Mom and me. Security guard. Ma'am, I'm going to need you to sit down and leave this person alone. What? No, they're evil. I'm trying to free them from the devil. Security guard. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Now, this kind of behavior isn't tolerated here. But my son has an appointment. I can't leave him here. Security guard. Can you call his father? If not, you will have to reschedule. Nice boy. My dad's in the car. At that point, security guard escorted Entitled Mom out of the building and Nice Boy's dad came in to watch his son. Nice Boy's dad apologized profusely for his wife's behavior and stated that she was a little eccentric. After 10 more minutes, I was called back and said goodbye to the boy. After my appointment, he and his dad were gone and I went on my way. Something that I think is funny, however, is what Nice Boy's dad had said regarding Entitled Mom. I don't even know why she said it was evil. She's not even Christian. She's an atheist. I kicked my best man out of my wedding for his gamer talk about my fiancé. I, 35 male, am engaged to May, 35 female. My best friend, Andre, 35 male, is the best man. Fake names. First, details. May is a huge anime and gamer nerd. Like, huge. We're all gamers, but she has, like, every system under the sun and loves playing video games, including the retro ones like Tetris and Sonic. She's also into MMORPGs, like Final Fantasy, JRPGs, like the Tales of Series, and games like My Time at Porsche and Animal Crossing. May and Andre have always gotten along, but they never actually hung out near video games together. I had him and two of our other friends over for a couple of beers and cigars. Andre heard May turn on her Switch, and he asked if she had Super Smash Brothers. She said yes, and Andre said, Let me show you a thing or two, in a joking manner. I warned Andre that he was going to get thrashed, to which he made the comment, Girl gamers don't scare me. No, May did not hear him. Well, May suited up with Yoshi, and she absolutely destroyed all of them without trying. They asked her to change characters. She went to Young Link, then Peach, then Jigglypuff, then Roy, and lastly her favorite character, Ness beat them all. Now I'll admit, my friends have short tempers with gaming. I could see they were frustrated, so I proposed we do something else. Everyone except Andre was done with the games. He proposed they play Tetris, free on the Switch and already downloaded. And once again, Andre lost. Hard, like extra hard, painfully hard. To put it short, he got completely thrashed. May won first place in two-player every game. Andre stopped playing, and they all went home afterwards, annoyed. I don't think May noticed. Later on, Andre and my friends invited May to a game of Rainbow Six. 
May gladly accepted and chose her favorite, Frost. They played the private party matches and she basically was always the last one standing. May told the guys she was going to take a bathroom break and put her headset down. I asked May if I could play the next round. She agreed and I put on her headset only to hear my friends talking trash about her. They were saying things like, why are girls such tryhards? And she's good at gaming, but I bet she can't make a sandwich. Now, they didn't know I was there, so I spoke and told them to shut up. Andre laughed and said they were just joking, and I said that's not funny, and what if May came back and heard them? He said it's just gamer talk, and I said it wasn't. Andre told me I was being a jerk and dragging down the group. He also told me they wouldn't be talking smack if I told May to stop trying so hard. Long story short, after an argument, I kicked Andre out of the wedding. I turned the PS4 off. When May asked why it was off, I said the others got off, but I didn't tell her what they said. Our friends were saying I was overreacting and they didn't mean it, but I honestly don't care. It just made me so mad. Am I the jerk? Did I overreact? Edit. I do plan to tell May what happened. This only happened last night and she's at her mom's right now. I plan to tell her tomorrow. Gamer talk, bro talk, locker room talk. Try and associate it with whatever culture or subculture you want. It's all hateful regardless. Not the jerk. Yep, not the jerk. Good on you for standing up for her. If the bros weren't so immature, maybe they could find someone besides their moms to make them a sandwich. Bravo to you. Tell them bros to turn off mom's basement light when they're done. As someone who's been playing games all my life, there are a few things I find more irritating than some absolute crap like this best man trying to associate his pathetic complaining as a standard part of the hobby. It's not gamer talk, it's jerk person talk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his friend? Please let us know. Something tells me Andre's diet consists primarily of Doritos and Mountain Dew. Am I the jerk for wanting to tell my husband's sister where he takes her son whenever he's babysitting for her? Hear me out. My husband's sister, Nicole, had a difficult upbringing. Her parents kicked her out and disowned her and cut financial support off after she refused to marry the family friend. She instead went to live with her late boyfriend who passed shortly after their son was born. My in-laws kept pressuring Nicole to let them meet their grandkid. They harassed her to the point where she got a restraining order against them and that's when they stopped. But they, including my husband, have been complaining about what a horrible thing she did and said that she broke the family and robbed them of their grandkid. My husband has contact with Nicole and he started offering to babysit her son for her after she finally found a new job and she's been grateful for this. However, he's been doing this ever since he started babysitting his nephew. He'd wait till she'd drop his nephew off, then he'd get him into the car and drive to my in-laws so that they could see him. He'd stay gone and come back 30 minutes before Nicole is expected to arrive. I didn't want to say anything at first, but then I couldn't stand thinking about how betrayed and hurt Nicole would feel if she found out. I told my husband what he's doing is wrong since his nephew's mom did not consent to him going to my in-laws house, but he told me he's doing this for his nephew's sake and told me to shut up and stay out of his family affairs. This caused an argument between us. I told him if he doesn't stop, then I'd tell Nicole. He said I wouldn't, then explained that he didn't think it was fair for Nicole to punish his parents like that and ban them from seeing their grandkid. I told him this is serious because she has a restraining order against them and our nephew shouldn't be there. I insisted I'd tell her if this doesn't stop, but he said if I'd do that, I'd cost him to lose his nephew and called me bitter and cruel for even entertaining the idea. He told me if I do that, then he'll let my in-laws know and they won't be happy with me. He urged me to mind my own business and stop trying to divide the family and condone Nicole's unjustified hatred for his parents. Not the jerk. Your husband is an absolute jerk who is helping his parents to break the law. Were I you, I'd let Nicole know what's going on immediately and encourage her to call the police next time your husband takes her son to her parents. Let the law deal with them all. This right here, it's not a family matter, it's a legal one. Not sure how old the kid is, but they will say something to their mom one day. I imagine when that happens, the police and the courts will be involved. Your husband is looking at a lot of trouble for doing this. If I were you, I'd seriously reconsider if this is a family you want to be part of. OP, you're not the jerk, but the family you married into has a lot of them. Well, what do you think? Should OP tell her sister-in-law what's going on or not? Please let us know. Restraining orders ain't nothing to play around with, bruh. 
I should know. I've thought about getting one against Reddit Boy over here. What have I even done to you? I'm sorry, it's just your head. It kind of creeps me out. Am I the jerk for canceling my daughter's birthday and making her call her classmates to explain why? Here's the situation. My daughter, Abby, just turned 11 and was supposed to have a birthday party last month with the girls in her class. She is autistic and has ADHD that we haven't found the right treatment for, so she struggles to make friends, and this would have been the first non-family party she has had. In the last few months, Abby went to two other birthday parties where the whole class was invited, which is why she asked to have a larger friend party this year in our backyard. Unfortunately, because of the timing, Taylor, her best friend, wouldn't be able to make it because her family was out of town. The day before the party, I was letting Abby use my phone to give her classmates the time and location information, and I overheard this exchange. Other girl. Is Taylor going to be there? Abby. No, she's lame and can't come. I sternly told Abby to hang up and explain herself. She tried to tell me that she wasn't serious, but I thought it was incredibly mean to call her only friend lame and felt like she was behaving horribly. She insisted that it was just a joke and wouldn't agree when I told her that Taylor would be heartbroken if she heard Abby call her lame. I told her that she didn't deserve to have a party if she couldn't cherish her friend and decided to teach her a lesson. I made her call all 12 girls that were invited, including the ones she had already called to tell the information, and explain to them that there wasn't going to be a party after all because she was being punished for saying something rude about Taylor. She was appropriately embarrassed and cried a lot, and I think it definitely taught her a lesson. Bruh! So I felt like this was done and dusted, but Taylor came over last weekend for a sleepover and I talked to her mom for a bit at drop-off. She told me she heard about what happened because the other parents had been discussing my punishment and thought it was too harsh, and insinuated I should go easier on Abby because she's a sweet and sensitive kid. I wasn't expecting this, so I brushed it off until she left but got annoyed that other parents are judging me for my actions when my kid did something that was not sweet or sensitive. When Taylor's mother returned to pick her daughter up, she again laid it on thick how much Taylor liked Abby and how she was glad they were friends. And I said, yup, and now Abby knows to treat her friends well and not take them for granted. It got awkward when Taylor's mom kept gushing about Abby and low-key implying that she didn't deserve to be punished, and I snapped back, well... I guess you and everyone else knows how to parent better than I do. I'm still seething over this and want to know if my actions with Abby and Taylor's mom were warranted because I feel like everyone else is taking crazy pills. Edit. I've said in multiple DMs, but I will say here as well that I was wrong and I'm disgusted with myself. I will clear up that Abby does go to weekly therapy, but we haven't seen a psychologist or done family therapy since she was eight. I was also suspected of having ADD as a kid, but my parents didn't do much to investigate after one type of medication failed to help me, so I don't think about it that much and don't know if that's relevant. I sat with Abby after supper and apologized for my actions and enforced that she is a good kid and a great friend to Taylor. She started tearing up and told me she was hurt that the other girl asked about Taylor because apparently some kids had said they wouldn't go since Taylor wasn't there. Abby felt guilty because while she was just joking about Taylor being lame, she was hurt that they liked Taylor and not her. I hadn't even considered this and I'm heartbroken for her that I kicked her when she was down. She is a sweet and sensitive girl and I'm very lucky she forgave me. I will be looking into family therapy and connecting with the school to fix this and told Abby that she has a week to decide how and with who she wanted to celebrate a belated birthday. Thanks to everyone who advocated for my daughter when I failed her. You're the jerk. Major one too, like massive. Your daughter is already struggling to fit into social situations, and her neurological disorders could be the cause of why she thinks such raw humor is acceptable. And besides the fact that you think it's inappropriate to joke like that, have you ever considered that Abby was in fact being honest and saying that lighthearted insults is the way it is between her and Taylor? You jumped onto a conclusion that is based around your comfort and boundaries with jokes. And how is that punishment relevant to what you assumed to be hurtful? Yeah, I canceled my socially struggling daughter's first real birthday party because I took offense on someone's behalf that wasn't even there. I truly have to say this is the second time I've read something so obviously jerkish, like a OP on this sub, and I'm sitting here writing this with absolute disgust on how some people will lie to you by saying you're not the jerk. You humiliated your daughter, ruined her first experience being seen by everyone, and probably ruined the trust she had left in you. 
just please take one look outside of your own perspective. You were so cruel, even parents outside of your family had to jump into defense for your own daughter. I hope you read this whole thing twice as well. Edit. I just want to say I'm very grateful that people are on the same page as me. I truly was worried that people would defend such cruelty. It's a great day to see some humanity in this world. I'm a psychologist that works with kids with disabilities. Have you got any idea how hard it is for most kids on the spectrum to make friends and be accepted by their peers? This party was a milestone, and not only OP took it away from her, but she humiliated her as well. Honestly, if I were her kid's therapist, I'd consider this a warning sign and pay attention to her behavior towards her daughter. What's interesting is the daughter is doing better socially than her mom. She's being lame is a common, good-natured dig when someone can't hang out. The mom missed this social cue by about 10,000 feet. Well, what do you think? Did mom overreact or not? Please let us know. Mom's actions were pretty lame, weren't they? Badang ching! Don't ever do that again. It's not that I can't play chess. It's that I don't choose to play chess. So I learned to count because I wanted to play cards with my brother. He was 10 years older than me, and I thought that the world revolved around him. Because my father was narcissistic, it wasn't until years later that I realized what a positive male role model he was. My brother was games obsessed. We would play hands of rummy that went on for weeks, game after game of Monopoly that lasted months. When I got to about eight, I had the chance to join the school chess club, so the summer before, I begged him to teach me to play chess. It was then that I discovered that most chess players out in the wild like to take time pondering their moves. Me, I like to play a game, finish it, learn from it, and then play another. For me, it was quantity and quality that taught me. By the time the year was out, I had a decent ranking in the school chess league, but my heart wasn't in it. I put my chess set away and focused on playing blackjack with my brother. It seemed that my knack with numbers and a mild case of synesthesia where numbers and cards have personalities made me a natural and I loved the game. We also played a version of Whist where we would bid on tricks and these became our go-to games. As time went on, I would avoid playing chess because it just didn't grab me. If asked by anyone, I'd say, no, I don't play. Then came the day when a boyfriend wouldn't take no for an answer. This guy had the biggest chip on his shoulder, so much so that it caused a permanent stoop. I'd self-financed my further education, but I'd managed to do that because your social class gave you all the breaks. I'd got a great job through working hard, but that was because your social class gave you all the breaks. I got promotions through self-financed study in my own time, but that was because your social class gave you all the breaks. You get the idea. So he decides that he is a chess champion. He was undiscovered because, you guessed it, his social class as a kid had stopped him. He comes down for the weekend with a chess set so he could sit and study the board. He asked me if I played chess and I gave my standard answer. I know how to, but I don't play chess. Well, this must have eaten away at him. Here was an opportunity for him to show his superiority to me by beating me at chess. He'd been beating all his friends, now he could wipe the floor with me. On and on, he went at me about playing a game. I kept saying that I don't play chess, but he wouldn't let it go. In the end, I gave in. He sets the board up and announces that he will be white. Yep, you don't do that, but I just wanted it over. He starts, standard opening. Game goes as predicted for the first few moves. Now, as I said, I was a quite competent chess player. I just don't like all the humming and umming and so on. I find it a bit pretentious. I'm not a great player, so never took it to the level where timed moves would have made it more fun, but I'd studied a number of games as part of chess club, and because I have a great visual retention, these things stayed. A few moves further, and I can see what he's trying to do. It's a standard gambit, played it out a number of times. About 10 moves in, and I'm bored. I'm really, really bored. It's 40 minutes. I'm moving a piece immediately. He's doing all the things I hate. So I stop concentrating and start moving pieces by instinct. And you got it. I sacrificed a piece and I can see the gloating on his face. He thinks he's got me. He checks me. Two moves later and I've put him in mate. He throws the board and pieces across the room. Him. You said you couldn't play chess. Me. No, I said I didn't play chess. Not that I couldn't. Him. Well, if you don't like playing chess, you should have let me win. Me. That's not how it works. Him. I deserve to win. Me. That's still not how it works. Edit. To mention, I dumped him a few years later and have now been with Hubby for nearly 20 years. 
Edit 2. He was 36 at the time. Am I the jerk for naming my kids without their dad's input and refusing to change their names when he disagreed? I, female 23, recently had twins about 7 weeks ago. Me and their dad were engaged, planning on getting married, and did plan the pregnancy. He was the one who had really pushed the idea and convinced me, so when he decided to up and leave when I was about 14 weeks pregnant, it sucked. During my pregnancy, we had minimal contact, mainly around custody and the few requests on updates with the pregnancy. It's surprisingly, he did fight for custody, to have 0%. He'll have visitation and parental rights, but that's it. The last time we talked before the babies were born, it was three days before my C-section. This was planned and he was aware of the date and location, etc. The babies were in the NICU for two weeks and during this time, he didn't visit or text. Obviously, you need to name your kids and so I ended up choosing them myself since we hadn't gotten to that stage. I also gave them my last name since I'll be the one to do appointments, etc. and raise them. From his lack of interest throughout pregnancy, I didn't think he cared. Three weeks after they were born and I'd taken them home, he rocks up. He asks what I name them and when I tell him, he said they don't look like their names and the names are stuck up names. He then says their names and his last name, but I corrected him and told him they'd taken my surname. He got upset and it became a tense situation. He demanded I change their names. I said no. He told me to combine our last names. I said no. I told him a parent that fights for 0% custody of their kids doesn't show much concern or care about said kid, especially since there are no physical or mental etc. reasons to not be able to parent. He told me I was unreasonable and unhinged. I told him that paying child support was the bare minimum and if he wanted to stay in their names, he should have shown up or called when they were born and not waited three weeks to even ask what his own kids' names were. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You're right that normally names are a two yes situation, but your case is not normal. Your ex doesn't get to show up three weeks after the birth and start making demands. If I were you, I would refer all his calls to your lawyer and don't even worry about his nonsense. P.S. Congratulations on your twins. Am I the jerk because I marked off my old tenant's mail as no longer lives here? We used to rent out our basement, but our family has grown so we needed the space. So we gave our tenants six months notice to move out. This was over two years ago that they moved out. The tenants incorporated a business using our address a month before moving out and never told us. It was a random name and FedEx packages came to our door that I refused to take because there was no name. I was afraid we were getting scammed. Tenants informed us when they noticed the tracking of their packages and told us then. So I accepted their business packages for the time being. Anyway, when they moved out, we asked them to change their address so they'd get their mail. For one year, their mail still kept coming but no FedEx packages. I texted saying, please get your mail, but please change your address. After one year, I started marking their mail, return to sender. This person doesn't live here. I don't text them anymore. Last week, a FedEx package to their business arrived at my door and I refused it saying, we have no business here. I don't know what that is. I'm not taking it. The old tenant texted me a few minutes later saying, Why did you send my package? I said, You don't live here anymore. Stop sending your mail to my house. I think they may have been tracking it. He texted back, But you've always texted me. I live in an apartment now and I work during the day so I can't get packages. I have to drive to FedEx and it's an hour away. Just take my package. I said, No, I won't. Update your address. My husband said I should just help out because they were good tenants, but I refuse. It smells scammy to me and I don't like that their business is still listed under my address when they don't even live here. Am I the jerk for refusing to help pick up their packages delivered to my house? Not the jerk. The former tenant can very easily get a P.O. box at the local post office and get packages there. This, it's very common for businesses to have a P.O. box for exactly this reason. Definitely not the jerk and I would be unimpressed with the tenant still having your address listed for their business. If they refuse to change it, is there any legal route you can follow up on? My Karen sister demands to be my realtor. I am a real estate flipper. Early on in my career, I met up with Tina, a realtor of 25 plus years who showed me a home that I ended up not buying. We weirdly hit it off as a sort of mom slash daughter vibe. She's about 30 years older than me and I'm the same age as her daughter and became sort of a mentor slash mentee situation. Tina took me under her wing 
taught me half of everything I know, found me deals, found me people to buy my fixed up places, and basically taught me the ropes. She handles situations I'm still learning to handle, like when a foreclosure auction goes wrong. I'm definitely just starting to learn. Tina is very experienced. The problem. My younger sister, Penny, 26, female, is about to get her real estate license. We were having dinner with our dad, and our dad says to me how great it's going to be when Penny and I are working together. I gave him a confused look. Penny then piped up that once she got her license, she'd be handling all of my flips, purchases, and sales because she is family. I told her that if I was looking for my own house, sure, I would go with her. For my flips, I work with Tina exclusively because Tina had connections that I did not, such as discount flooring and other such things, and Tina got me a lot of business and sales. Cutting Tina out would basically remove at least one third of my sales and end my discounts at a lot of places as friend of Tina, and I'm not willing to do that, especially in these kinds of times. Also, Tina will stop giving me real estate tips for good flip properties if she's not my realtor. Imagine how rude it would be for me to get a tip from her and then use my sister to buy the property. My sister and dad are now upset with me and no amount of explaining can make them understand that this is a business decision and I simply can't afford to burn this bridge. I told Tina what was going on and Tina so very graciously offered to help mentor Penny like she has been with me and Penny was having none of it. Penny is so offended that I would continue to give my business to someone outside the family. I think I've done more than enough to help my sister here, but my father and sister think I'm the jerk. I feel like I might be the jerk because you are supposed to prioritize family, but then again, I feel like it's unreasonable for me to take a huge pay cut and loss of all my resources just so my sister can get sales, which again will be fewer due to Tina's clients not buying them. So, am I the jerk for not hiring my sister to replace Tina? Karen steals my family's name for her baby and refuses to change it. This is a throwaway because my brother-in-law, 24 male, knows my main account and sorry for the errors I'm posting from my phone. So my stepsister, 23 female, is having a new baby soon and my whole family is excited for her and this will be the first grandbaby for my mother and stepfather. I, 25 male, am half white and half Polynesian. They are full white for reference. So the story. My family got together and is having a good time. We were all chatting in the living room and then the topic of the first grandbaby comes up between my mom and my stepsister. They're talking about what she will do with work and normal expecting talk when they start talking about names and my mom starts suggesting names like Sam and Riley. Then my sis says a Polynesian name. Think Leilani or along those lines. I was a little offended because the name has a lot of importance in my family. It has a very important meaning. I would go into more detail, but the name is so specific they would know who's posting this. She said she heard the name when talking to me. Duh, it's a family name, and it has been on her mind ever since, and she's just fallen in love with it. Polynesian names are very significant to the families and people with those names. In most Polynesian cultures, names tell a story and have a significance to the family. Only certain families can have these names because of respect and genealogy and honor, like a title. I get that it's not normal here in the US, but I was offended that she thinks she can just take a name from my family like that without even thinking about my customs. I feel like it was offensive to my people because she didn't even know where my family is from. I would always tell her the island my family is from and she would be like, okay, whatevs. She doesn't know anything about the culture or customs. So I pulled her aside and in privacy told her I didn't feel comfortable with the name she had chosen. I told her the importance of names in my culture and how they have meaning and I even offered to sit down with her and find a story or meaning she liked and translate it into a name of my people so she can still have a pretty name, but it would also not be taking from the culture. Then she got really mad at me and said that it doesn't matter, the culture, it's just a name and why can't I just let her be happy? I told her I would never call her kid by that name because it would be offensive to my family and I. Then she got our family involved. They all started calling me names. So I tried to explain to them the meaning of names in my culture. They told me I was in America, not the island my family is from, so it doesn't matter. So I called them some names and they could at least have some knowledge or some appreciation for my culture before they start taking from it. I want to know, am I the jerk for making such a big deal out of a name? Edit 1. I keep seeing I don't own the name. 
This is why I say culture, because back on the island I'm from, my family does actually own the name. You can't name someone that name unless you're in our family. That's why I say I know it's different in the US, but it's not like that in our culture. Edit 2. My grandpa said we are proud to share our culture. We'll teach you our dances and share our food, but we draw the line when you start taking our sacred family names. These names are passed down in our family like Americans would pass down war medals or a very important pocket watch. It's how we connect to family and our ancestors. I would be fine with any other name in my culture as long as it wasn't one of these. These names bring great pride to our families. We track them through what is basically a mural that are decades if not hundreds of years old. I would explain it like these names were bestowed or given to us by God for lack of a better analogy. That's what our family names mean to us. My stepsister has no relation to my Polynesian side and has always made fun of my name. When I pulled her aside, I tried to explain to her that the same way she has treated me is how other kids will treat her daughter. I have also been with my stepsister since I was six. Not the jerk. I'm Tongan. My name is literally what connects me to 10 generations of ancestors before me. It's what helps other Tongans identify me from others in the world. If she wants to name her kids that, fine, so be it. But it's out of your hands if her kid in the future wants to know what it means and the significance behind it. Not the jerk. I've been highly disappointed by the people on this board before, but especially so today. This isn't a situation where someone just chose a random name without context because they liked it. This is a situation where a family member explained the importance of naming conventions within a culture that your stepsister is privy to as a guest. Your stepsister is choosing to alienate your family in a way that has already been explained to her as disrespectful. That makes her the jerk. Polynesians are already being priced out of their ancestral homelands by luxury resorts and affluent Americans. They can't even keep their culturally significant names? Goodness gracious. You're the jerk. You don't get to decide what names are off limits for someone else's baby. Edit. Not surprised I'm getting downvoted. That's Reddit for you. This sub just shows, one, how uneducated people are on Polynesian culture, and two, how unwilling people are to learn. Every culture has different sacred things. For the Aboriginal people here in Australia, certain pictures can only be painted by certain people. In Commonwealth countries, you can't name your kid King or Prince because those titles are reserved for people who are entitled to them. In Australia, you can't name your kid General or Sergeant because those are titles reserved for people who have earned them. In your culture, certain names are reserved exclusively for a certain few people who are entitled to them. People should respect that, not the jerk. Not the jerk. Yeah, usually I'm one of the no one owns a name camp, but anyone who says that here is just uneducated. Cultural names bear a great significance and shouldn't be taken and used just because it's pretty. I'm white, but I have a Polynesian family. My cousins, for example, because my aunt married a Polynesian man, and I wouldn't dream of taking a name from that culture even though I think they're beautiful. It's just not appropriate. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his stepsister? Please let us know. You could always name the baby Karen. I'd be honored. Am I the jerk for blowing up at my husband for lying to me about my sister and her baby leaving when he actually kicked her out? My sister, who's 20, got out of a terrible relationship and moved in with me and my husband and brought her five months old son. She's dealing with a handful of issues from PPD to depression. I asked my husband if he'd be okay with her moving in and he said absolutely, not just this, but he was the one who picked her up and brought her home. She stayed for two weeks and helped around the house. My husband started complaining about the baby crying, but a newborn is expected to cry, especially at night. He said it's causing him stress, although I suggested he put on earbuds. He suddenly told me to forget it, and so I did. Last week, I had to go out of town to attend a friend's funeral without my husband. He said he wanted to stay with my sister to make sure she's okay. I returned home the next day and didn't find her or her baby home. My husband said she contacted a friend in another town and wanted to move with them and left that morning. He handed me a letter he claimed was from her. This felt so odd, especially after reading the letter. I called her phone many, many times, but turned out my husband found it and said she must have left it behind. I was worried. I had no means of contacting her to make sure she was okay. I contacted relatives, but they knew nothing. Yesterday, I got a call from an unknown number and it was her. We talked and she told me that she didn't leave on her own, but my husband kicked her out after telling her that she was no longer welcome. 
and she needed to take responsibility for her decisions. I was in shock as she explained that she's not with a friend, but at a shelter, and she has no money. I waited till he got home, and I blew up at him. He admitted he faked the letter and hid her phone, then argued that it's his house too, and he has a say, but he shouldn't have lied to me about my sister and causing her to be homeless. He said I was being unfair and wrong to lash out at him for wanting peace in his home. I went upstairs and refused to argue anymore. I told him I'm going to pick her up tomorrow and he said he'd change the locks while I'm gone and I won't be allowed to bring her home. I'm thinking of going to a hotel, but he kept saying that I'm letting my sister affect our lives by prioritizing her. But there's a baby involved, my nephew, and I can't leave him homeless. I get that it's his house too, but I don't see why he's so against her staying. Edit. He returned home and we started arguing again. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm going to stay at a hotel for tonight and I'm leaving in an hour or so. He's wanting to talk again now, but I'm incredibly overwhelmed and stressed out and I need some time by myself. I don't care if he's going to change the locks or not. I'm working on meeting up with my sister as soon as possible so we can talk more openly about what happened and hopefully try and figure something out. Not the jerk. He waited until you were out of town so that you couldn't object, so that you couldn't protect her as he not only kicked her out, but took her phone so she couldn't contact you. He's dangerous. He threw her and the baby out into the street without a care in the world. Now he's threatening to lock you out of your own house. You need to divorce him immediately. This, he left them both out on the street and without protection because he was losing sleep and stressed. Now he's threatening to evict you from your own home. This is abhorrent. Bring her and the nephew back, consult an attorney, and get him out ASAP. Divorce the man. OMG. He went behind your back to do this to your loved one. He faked a letter. He hid her phone from you. This is completely out of proportion to anything that happened. This was unwarranted cruelty and a breach of trust. Get out of that relationship. He will absolutely repeat this behavior, not the jerk. He stole her phone and sent her to a homeless shelter with no phone. Like, I don't know anyone's numbers. If someone took my phone and sent me to a homeless shelter, I'd basically be stuck there forever because I'd never be able to call someone for help. It's super lucky OP's sister was even able to get in contact. There is a lot wrong with this. One, the lies and manipulative way your husband went about this. I'm not sure if there's any way of walking that back. You might want to consider leaving him just for that alone. Two, he cared so little about your sister and her baby that he put her out on the street. Again, that kind of lack of remorse is kind of a deal breaker, don't you think? Three, if you're married and live there, it is straight up illegal for him to change the locks on you. I could go on, but this is more than enough. Not the jerk. Girl, run for real. This guy is bad. You can't move forward with him from here, with this being a part of your history together. Find a place, maybe with your sister as a roommate, and move on with your life. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Hey, desperate times call for desperate measures. Just kidding, the guy's a jerk. Schedule me for evening shift? Make certain you know what you're doing. A couple of recent stories reminded me of something that happened way back when. I was a teenager and had a job at a hotel as a busboy in a coffee shop. We had about 95 seats and on a Saturday and Sunday, we would do about 400 covers. It was busy, but I was good. Afternoon, things would slow down, so I would jump into the dish pit and help them catch up. One Sunday, the back of house manager and the general manager were having lunch and they called me over. They asked me to take the next Saturday's evening shift in the dish pit. I reminded them that weekends were pretty busy and they would have a problem if I wasn't bussing on breakfast. They told me they would get someone else to cover bussing but they really needed me in the dish pit that Saturday night. I agreed, but told them I would need to leave at 11 p.m. on the dot, as I relied on public transport to get home and there was no way I could work late. They said, no problem, and we had a deal. I showed up at 3 p.m. to absolute chaos. Guess who they had cover bussing? That's right, the dishwasher. The pit was absolutely stacked with dishes, and then I found out why they needed me on that shift. Banquets and the coffee shop used the same glassware, plates, and cutlery, and there was a massive banquet going on upstairs. When I got there, the cook line and the banquet crew were going nuts. Alexa, cancel. When I got there, the cook line and the banquet crew were going nuts. 
prepping and setting up tons of centerpieces, place settings, that sort of thing. We had busing carts and the banquet crew was loading them up and running them up the elevators to the banquet hall. It was pandemonium. The back of house manager kept yelling at me, I need more forks right now. And I was fishing through the dozens of bus pans from day shift trying to get him the stuff he needed. It took a while, but I managed to do it for him. I took it with a grain of salt since he was actually a pretty good guy, just stressed to the max. Finally, the banquet stuff all went upstairs and I could clear the backlog. It took me until about 8 p.m. Then, nothing. There were about 400 people attending this banquet and occasionally I would see a member of the banquet team come down and I would ask them where the dish carts were. These guys treated me like crap and snapped that they would bring them down when they had a chance. Sure enough, it was about 10 p.m. when the parade of banquet bozos started wheeling cart after cart of dirty dishes in by the pit. There were tons of them, 30 or 40 at least, and none of the bus tubs were sorted. It was all just tossed in. They weren't even scraped into the trash. There was leftover food all over the plates. Just before 11 p.m., I see the back of house manager talking to his crew and I went up to him. I was really ticked off. What the heck am I supposed to do here? I asked, gesturing to the carts. Wash the darn things, he snapped back. There's no time. I leave in 15 minutes, remember? Well, you'll just have to stay late. I can't. I have a bus to catch. If I miss it, I miss my connection, and that's the last bus. So no, I'm leaving, and I told you that last week. He starts getting irate, and I just took off my apron and left without a word. The next weekend, I arrived for my busboy shift, and I get called into the general manager's office. The back of house manager was there, and the general manager is asking me why I abandoned the dish pit in such chaos. As it turns out, nobody on the banquet crew would work the pit, and in the morning, there was nowhere near enough dishware and cutlery for the coffee shop. The dishwasher they had covering took one look at this mess in the back and quit on the spot. They had to close the coffee shop and lost out on a ton of money. I just looked at them and reminded them that when I said I would take the dish pit for that shift, that I would be leaving on time. It's not my fault that the banquet crew didn't start bringing down the carts until after 10 p.m. The general manager looked at the back of house manager and asked him what time they served the meals. 6 p.m. So you're telling me that your crew took over three hours to roll the dishes back downstairs and you didn't do anything about it? What the heck were they doing? Why didn't you assign one or two to push carts? Then I pointed out that all the carts weren't sorted and that the plates weren't even scraped. The back of house manager gave me the stink eye and the general manager excused me and said to head down to the coffee shop and pick up the busing. The following weekend I came in and there was a big notice targeted at the banquet guys. All bus pans were to contain only one item, one pan for dinner plates, one pan for side plates, one pan for hardware, another for cutlery. All dishes were to be in the dish pit no later than 15 minutes after being pulled from the table. All plates were to be scraped of excess food waste before going in the pan. The banquet crew was upset that they actually had to do their jobs, and the back of house manager was upset that a lowly busboy slash dishwasher put him in the hot seat. They never asked me to take an evening shift again. Am I the jerk for telling my sister to stop projecting her insecurities onto other women? My sister and her husband are going through very public marital issues. To give you the condensed version, basically, my brother-in-law was caught cheating on my sister by my wife during an event. She happened to be working there as a bartender. My wife immediately told my sister, in private, without telling my brother-in-law that she knew. And my sister proceeded to get very angry with my wife, accusing her of ruining her marriage. This culminated in my sister breaking down and screaming at my wife during a family dinner, calling her a jerk who likes to break up marriages and a person with no hobbies. My sister's very public rant about my wife led to my brother-in-law admitting in front of my family members that he cheated. This of course led to more drama. This all happened a few months ago and as far as I can tell, my sister and her husband are not going to split up. After this whole situation, I decided to distance myself from my family for a little bit. I thought that my sister needed time to process everything and I didn't think it was fair to my wife to subject her to my sister's rage. I sent a long text message essentially telling her that I wanted her to sincerely apologize to my wife. My sister apologized and I thought that it would be the end of that. My dad invited my wife and I to celebrate his birthday at his place. I knew that everyone would be there, including my sister and her husband, so I was a bit hesitant to go. 
but my wife assured me that everything would be all right. To start, everything was going well. My sister practically avoided us, which I didn't mind, and my brother-in-law was glued to her side the entire time, so we didn't really face any drama. Everyone was cordial towards one another, and no one mentioned my brother-in-law's infidelity. At one point, I think my wife asked my brother-in-law to move over so that she could sit down. She's currently on crutches. And when my brother-in-law got her a chair and helped her sit down, my sister got extremely mad at my wife for being too friendly with her man, her exact words. My wife was confused and explained that she just wanted a seat, but my sister wasn't having any of it. She started full-on yelling at my wife for doing what she always does and ruining other people's relationships. My sister has a loud voice, so literally everyone stopped and looked at her and my wife. My wife looked pretty embarrassed and just muttered a, sorry, and even wanted to go stand up. But I butted in and told my sister to stop yelling at my wife and stop acting extremely insecure in front of other women and go for counseling or something. For whatever reason, my sister ran out of the room crying after that and my wife and I left soon after. My brother-in-law texted an apology on behalf of my sister but told me that I was a little rude and that I should apologize. My wife thinks that I may have been too harsh. My entire family is split. Some are saying that I was too mean to her. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Text your brother-in-law back and suggest that if he stops cheating, that might also make things better. This, brother-in-law has no right to complain. Sure, but like, brother-in-law isn't really the problem here. Of course he's a jerk, but the best case scenario is that this dumpster fire marriage ends. I'm guessing some couples have the emotional maturity and honesty to move past an infidelity, but this one clearly doesn't. So of the two poorly behaved people in this story, brother-in-law and sister, brother-in-law and his infidelity will one day, God willing, not be OP's problem. I'd honestly ignore him, but his sister and her delusions, insecurity, whatever you call it, that will be part of his family dynamic regardless, and that's more important to address. After all, she's not going to call it on her marriage and be able to work towards being less insane until she's ready to put the blame where it belongs. Your sister is absolutely projecting. Keep standing up for your wife, since your sister won't let her. Gotta slip a crutches joke in. Absolutely not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his sister? Please let us know. Plot twist! They were in an open relationship and she just didn't want anyone to know. I've never laughed so hard. Karen was speechless. For the past five months, I've been working at this restaurant. It has its ups and downs, but so far I enjoy it. Anyways, some important background information first. We hire kids. When I say kids, I mean 15 and older, and we have about six of them that work with us. They work as bussers, hosts, or food runners. They aren't bad. Sometimes they can be a little too much, but sometimes they can be just downright hilarious. This is one of those times. On to the story. I was serving tables outside on our patio. The restaurant was full, we were all busy, and I had a six table section. There was one table in particular that was just downright horrible, a foretop of old grouchy ladies. The main one complained about everything, her drinks, having her seat being next to the door, it was too hot outside, you name it, she complained about it. She was probably in her 60s and so were her other horrible friends. I knew their food was running up, in all honesty I could have ran the food by myself. I wasn't in the weeds by any means, but I just didn't want to deal with them right now. So I let our food runner do it. Now this particular food runner was one of our 15 year olds. He was very brazen, bold, and had no fear of consequences. And was one of the most downright savage teenagers I've ever met. I was at another table, one that was directly across from this horrific Karen table. I had my back face towards the group of Karens. I was talking and taking the orders of my other table when I hear the sound of the food running boy naming each plate as he handed them to the older ladies. As soon as he's done, I hear the main Karen speak up. My fish isn't cooked. I eavesdrop while taking the order. I already knew this was going to be bad. Ma'am, you haven't even tried it, the boy says. I don't need to try it. You can tell by looking at it. It's not done. Moments go by and I hear a loud gasp come out of the main Karen. At this point, to heck with the table I'm at. I have to see this. I turn and her mouth is wide open in this disgusted and shocked look. I look at the boy who was holding her plate and had just taken a bite out of her fish. I freeze. She's frozen. 
Everything is stopped except for this boy who is chewing her food. He swallows it, but doesn't put the plate back down. Tastes pretty good to me, he says, and then he walks away, going through the door back inside. Karen is astounded. No words. I don't even know what to do at this point. I finish taking my table's order and walk straight past Karen and go back inside. I tell the manager that she didn't like the fish, they made her a new one and comped it off the check. I never told them what the boy did, but it did come out later because he was bragging about it to the other kids and of course it spread like wildfire. He got reprimanded, not fired, just a warning. Now to this day, I'm never going to get that out of my head. The look on her face, how a 15 year old just traumatized a Karen. I laugh every time I think about it. In case you are all curious, he finished the rest of her plate. Apparently he was hungry and he still works with us. Am I the jerk for turning my husband's gaming room into an office? My husband is out of a job, has been for months now and doesn't have any money because he spent it all on gaming gear and animals. I'm the breadwinner right now and recently was given a work from home job. We have two kids that understandably make a lot of noise so there's not a quiet spot in the house except the bedroom, but my husband refused to let me work from there and said that one, it makes me look unprofessional, and two, he doesn't want to be restricted from this space. I asked if he had let me take his gaming room and turn it into an office temporarily. He said no. I had a fight with him and ended up moving his gaming stuff into the bedroom. He found out and lost his temper. I told him he left me no choice, especially after I offered a compromise to share the room. But since he plays at random times, he said no. He kept yelling at me, calling me irresponsible and a jerk. I finally told him that this is part of the house that is my space too, but he said, no, 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 your space is the kitchen. This pushed me to lash back at him and he left, but said by the time he got back, everything needed to be put back. He came home drunk, so I didn't want to fight with him. He then kept ranting about wanting his room back, even after I tried to convince him to play in the bedroom all he wants. Yet he's not having it and wants the atmosphere his gaming room has. Am I the jerk for this, or is he being unreasonable? I'll give him the room back if it turns out that I'm the jerk, okay? ETA, some clarifications. A. When he said, my space is the kitchen, I think what he meant is that I control everything there from decoration to appliances, and I spend more time there compared to him. B. He used to contribute in a lot of things when he had a job. He used to pay for the kids' needs and handle bills and groceries while I handled other things. He makes sure to remind me about how much he used to do every day and tends to bring it up in every argument. He's not happy with losing his job, but circumstances are uncontrollable. Not the jerk. Can't work in your room, can't work in his gaming room, your kids need to be taken care of, Saying you belong in the kitchen is such a degrading comment. I hope things improve for you both. OP Honestly, it's tiring having to even fight about this. I've offered more than a compromise, but he wasn't having any of it. I get that his gaming room is his personal space that he worked hard to create, but I wouldn't have done this if circumstances were different. You could put his stuff plus a bed in the gaming room and you take the bedroom, which he's no longer allowed in. Not the jerk. A space for working trumps an entire space for playing video games. Besides, while you're working, he's taking care of the kids and the housework since he's unemployed, right? No, 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 your space is the kitchen? This sealed the deal for me. You're raising three kids. I'm a gamer myself, but if I were a stay-at-home dad, I'd be doing everything to make it easier for her while looking for a darn job. Then bro said that your space is the kitchen. I have no words. Might want to evaluate your marriage with this guy. Not saying divorce, actually I kind of am, but this dude needs a lesson. Not the jerk. Not the jerk, but what exactly is this dude bringing to the table, other than laziness, entitlement, and temper tantrums? Cheap father makes family wait for dinner for his well-done steak. This happened at a West Coast steakhouse. Every year on Thanksgiving, we would have a turkey special, which came with all the sides and dessert at one flat price. Most people came in for the turkey dinner, but some still ordered steak from the menu. As a server, I would let the guests who did order steak know that it would be just a few minutes longer than their turkey dinner, being that the turkey and sides were just plate and serve, which came out under 5 minutes, and most were fine with that. One table was a tin top, where everyone at the table ordered the turkey special, but the father of the family wanted a T-bone steak and well done. 
I informed them that it would be a bit longer than the turkey and if it was okay to bring the rest of the meals out first while he waited for the steak. No, we are family and we all eat together. So I immediately punch up his steak and the nine turkey dinners. Lo and behold, after 10 minutes, this father is demanding his steak while the rest of the family is just staring at each other waiting for their turkey. Sir, you asked for a well-done T-bone steak and it's full house right now. It will probably be another 10 to 15 minutes for it to come out. This is unacceptable. My family is starving and they want to eat already. Then maybe you should have allowed me to bring out the rest of the food and you could have waited for one steak. How dare you speak to me this way? I want to see the manager. I had already informed my boss and he was within earshot. Boss told him the same thing and said he would bring out the steak as soon as it was done with the rest of the food. 15 minutes passes and all the food hits the table. Finally, it's about time, the father exclaims. My boss and me say nothing, just enjoy and if there's anything else we can bring you. Father says nothing and begins to eat while the rest of the table is just staring daggers at him. Fast forward, everyone was finished with dessert. I bring the check and tell them thank you and will pick up their check when they're ready. I had not walked away a few feet when father is demanding why is there gratuity on the bill. I inform him tables six or more get auto gratuity. I want to see the man Goodness, would you shut up already? Chimes in the grandmother at the other end of the table. If you had not made us wait, we would have had a nice family dinner. Turns to me and asks me to bring her the check. He wasn't going to pay anyways. She looks at the bill, hands over her credit card, and thanks me for everything. When I come back, no one is talking to father, and they're just ignoring him. Wow, sounds like my father when I was a kid. We were sometimes eating out, and it was always my father who completely ruined our dinner experience, and it was always my mother who paid the bill. He was selfish, always rude to staff, and yelled at us very often. My mother got fed up with his behavior, and we've never been out to eat with my father since I was 10. Are you my sibling? I could right now tell you four very vivid memories from the four times we ate out as a family, in which I was ridiculously embarrassed and in two reduced to tears and another time we were kicked out because my dad accused the server of trying to hurt me. I hope you've gotten over the pain better than I have. Have you ever been embarrassed by your parents at a restaurant? Please let us know. Haven't we all read it, boy? Haven't we all? No, we're not here to eat. We're producing content right now. I work in a really cute restaurant that's popular with the blogger crowd. Our decor is pretty, our food is pretty, and our cocktails are pretty. The restaurant as a whole is quite Instagrammable. Unfortunately, we occasionally get influencers who think being present on Instagram, TikTok, etc. makes them the main character of the world, who thinks the rotation of the earth hinges on them, continuing to upload pictures of themselves in cute clothes. An event last month that I'm still angry about. A group of five girls came into our restaurant and for some reason they decide that it's the perfect place to have a photo shoot and a catwalk. Literally, we have girls who start strutting up and down the aisles between tables and filming each other. We had guest complaints because most people do not feel comfortable being filmed at their tables by random women in street clothes, so the manager comes out to check in with the ladies. At this point, they've decided to seat themselves at a table after ignoring the host, of course, and our manager asks if they're being attended to by a server yet. One of the girls has the gall to say, We're not here to eat. We're here producing content for our channels. So, of course, the manager tells them they'll need to leave, as our tables are reserved for guests only. They decide to stay and keep photographing each other. Our host decides to interfere before our manager comes back and tells the girls that they do need to leave when asked or our manager might call security to have them escorted out, which is a pretty sensible thing to me, right? Well, if you're an entitled influencer, apparently it's the worst thing in the world. Almost immediately after leaving, the girl actually uploads a whole testimony to Instagram, crying and saying that she and her girls discovered a cute restaurant, but the manager decided to kick them out for taking photos and stealing content and that our manager called security on them without warning, which shows that our manager was dangerous, and that our manager needs a culture class after putting them in danger. And on top of that, it's Black History Month. The gall and entitlement gets me. You can't come into a restaurant, start filming other people without their permission, 
sit at a table without buying anything and then refuse to leave when asked? You're making other people uncomfortable, inconveniencing guests who had a reservation and taking money out of the pocket of the server whose table you're sitting at. Shaking my head. Doesn't surprise me a bit. The number of people during tourist season who will try to bring in outside food to our air-conditioned dining room, pizza shop, no server or host, is mind-boggling. And they always act so surprised when we kick them out. I'm pretty sure one of the times our bathroom got dookie crayoned was because we had asked people with outside food to leave. Dealership said Sue, so I did. This all started December of last year and just finished last week. So I bought a car from one of those buy here and pay here places. I love the car. It's a Mazda 5 from 2014, basically the smallest minivan I've ever seen. Well, on Christmas, we drove to some family for dinner and celebration. When we went to leave, the car wouldn't start. We checked everything and found out the horn wasn't even connected. Any fuse that wasn't absolutely needed was simply missing and the tires were the original tires. Beyond that, we hooked up to the computer and it read several errors, but the one getting in the way was the immobilizer. I had never known the van had one. I called AAA and set up towing, but because we were in the middle of nowhere, AAA couldn't get a tow truck to us under our membership, free. So we had to call a tow truck and then submit the bill to AAA after the fact. So family let us borrow their car and the van was towed to a shop. A few days later and the shop calls and tells us what's wrong. I live in Texas, a single party consent state, and I record all of my calls thanks to an app on my phone. The long list of car issues isn't important. The point of this van is a basic work van. The only issue they found stopping it from running is the immobilizer and active and they can't touch it without talking to the dealer. I three-way call the dealership and the shop and we talk for 17.34 minutes during this call and the dealership acknowledged we were not behind and everything should be working unless it malfunctioned. The dealership also gave permission for the shop to bypass it and we would be reimbursed the towing and repairs. All the shop needed to do to get the van running was bypass the immobilizer and a couple days later we picked up the van and paid the bill. Both bills came to just under $300 and we started calling the dealership. The first few conversations go well and the phone rep seemed interested in helping, but mostly I end up getting tossed around from department to department and then disconnected. That went on for some time and I of course took to Reddit to find out options. As almost always happens, Reddit users know some crazy facts and how to get stuff done. So I followed their advice and kept calling, eventually getting to a supervisor and the first supervisor said he'd get it taken care of and we ended the call. Two more days go by and nothing is heard. So I call back, get tossed around and then get another manager who says, we are not responsible for mechanical issues and hangups. I call back now quite annoyed and eventually get back to the same manager. I explain I have all the information and call recordings including the repair shop three-way call. He cuts me off and says, what? Are you going to take us to court over $296.47? I don't think so, but go ahead and sue. We will win, and if that small amount is worth suing to you, you probably don't have the resources to actually sue. This of course made me quite upset, so off to a justice of the peace and explain what's happened. They give us a small claims form and explain the process. We can fill it out and pay for a constable to serve the dealership or fill out the paper and take it to the dealership unfiled and explain everything to a manager in person. We chose the cheaper route because the manager on the phone was right. We didn't have the money to have it served, only filed. So we transcribed the phone calls, found out how to fill out the paper. The hardest part was finding the agent. We didn't know what that meant, but we again turned to Reddit and learned. We gathered the bills and all the paperwork and made our way to the dealership's payment center. I wait in line and see the name of the manager is the same as the manager on the phone that told me to sue. I wait in line and when it's my turn, I ask to talk to John and he comes over and sits across from me. After making introductions and I confirm it's the same guy, I start to explain the situation again. As I'm explaining, I see when he recalls talking to me on the phone. He starts to dismiss me and I explain that he asked me to sue and I'm here with all my evidence and the unfixed suit giving him one final chance. He starts to look over the papers and asked if I still had the recordings. I said yes, I could email him a copy. We sit and talk for about an hour as he reads, then I sat with a slight aggravated tone 
If something isn't done today, not only am I going to head right back to the courthouse and file, as well as tack on as much for emotional distress and whatever else the clerk hinted at. The clerk was very open-mouthed with ideas, as well as send a copy of everything to every email on the corporate website. At this, our conversation drew the attention of a woman in a power suit who rushes over for a recap. I find out she's John's boss's boss's boss, and she's none too happy about how far things have gone. She assured me that all would be made right and gave me her cell number and email. I gave her the papers and left. The next Monday at 8 a.m., I got a call asking if credit being applied to the account would be acceptable. I say yes, and she explains they will credit $500 to the account as payments. The payments are only $155 every two weeks. I agree, and we talk for a few minutes. When I asked why it took this much just to get things done, she laughed and said, it shouldn't have, and certain people are no longer employed at this company. Well, today was Wednesday, and the day of the payment, but when I went to make the payment, it was already done. Thank you, power suit lady. My fiancé deleted my work project to get back at me for not going with him to his friend's birthday party. My fiancé's best friend's birthday party was yesterday. My fiancé wanted me to go with him, but I apologized and said I couldn't, because I had to finish a work project in the evening and barely had time. He said it was unacceptable since the party was held at a prestigious restaurant and all his friends were going to bring their partners. He insisted I go with him, but I told him if I don't complete this project soon, I will lose a potential promotion next month and someone else will take my place. He just looked at me and said, I just hope it'll be worth it, then walked out. I called him, but he hung up. I got done with my project and went to go take a shower. I got out and found him in the living room refusing to speak to me after I asked about the party. I went upstairs to finalize my project but found out that my entire work laptop had been reset. Everything got wiped including my project. My heart sank. I asked my fiance if he was behind this and he just looked at me and said that now we are even after I refused to come with him to the party and embarrassed him by forcing him to go alone and get weird looks and questions from everyone. I started yelling at him and called him insecure to care about his public image and looks and getting even just because I had to work. He said I contributed to this outcome and should have just gone with him. Now I had to start all over again. We started exchanging words and he told me to stop saying he's insecure and petty. He checked into a hotel and has been staying there constantly texting about how hurt he was that he had to hear me call him insecure and refusing to have any consideration for him. He said that I did make him look bad when I refused to come with him and he was hurt by that. Our ongoing argument is that I keep saying that just because we're a couple then I have to attend every event with him, while he keeps saying that it's classless and socially unacceptable when I let him attend alone unless I'm sick or traveling. You spelled ex-fiancé incorrectly. You're not the jerk. OP, you need to understand that undermining your career isn't just a normal insult or overstep. It is a distinct category because it is dangerous. If his controlling behavior gets worse, which it likely will, you will need money, your own health care, the ability to get out and live independently. You need your job to be safe. If he wants to be controlling, domineering, disrespectful, and do it in a way that undermines your financial independence and ability to leave him, you have to take that seriously. Not the jerk. You need to take a really good hard look at this relationship. What he did is not all right. What he did has the potential to affect your financial stability. What he did was horrible and I hope you see that. I really hope you consider getting out of this relationship because if this is what he does now when you're in the honeymoon phase, what is he going to be like when you're married? Please listen to us older experienced women when we tell you that this is going down a very bad path for you. He's also super insecure and childish if he can't go to a party alone and say his fiance has to work without being embarrassed. He's going to be mortified when he has to say he no longer has a fiancé at the next party he attends alone. I don't say this often, but girl, run. Like yesterday. I'm afraid this man wouldn't have been physically safe in my presence had he done this to me. You don't mess with someone's career like this. On the other hand, he's clearly a petulant child and is clearly not old enough to be dating anybody. Entitled mom demands free waffles, later sends her kids. This happened a few years ago. There was this one sunny Sunday and I was in a particularly good mood. I was walking around my new neighborhood. All the houses were built at the same time 
and about 50 families moved in and got settled in the last few months back then. People were still getting to know each other. I noticed a bunch of Girl Scouts going door to door with some homemade waffles. As I walked past, they approached me and tried to get me to buy some waffles. Told them to follow me home as I didn't bring money on my walk. While walking, we spoke a little and it turned out their sale had been underwhelming. I decided to buy all of their waffles. I was handed easily over 100 waffles. If I remember correctly, I spent about 60 to 70 euros. Happy faces ran off. I figured I'd open up my garage, pop up a small plastic table I keep in the garden shed, and plug in my waffle iron to heat up the waffles. Filled bowls with all kinds of sugar and placed a few syrups next to it. Next, I invited all the new neighbors over to my driveway for a free waffle by texting our Facebook group. Sure enough, a couple of families were keen and a small crowd gathered. It was all fun and games. People got to know each other better as I warmed up the waffles and I had fun with topping them. Made monstrosities with Nutella, ice cream, sprinkles, maple syrup, jam, all in one measly waffle. That kid still loves me. His mother, not so much. But this story isn't about her, and she's a sweetheart really. After some time, a frowning lady who, for some reason, appeared to be in quite the hurry, made her way through my neighbors and approached me. I hadn't seen her before. She asked what all this was and why it was happening. Told her the entire story and that it was based on a whim. I don't know how to describe her that would do her character justice, but she was very in your face, way too intense. So they're free? She asked. Well, yeah. I told her again, I meant to bring neighbors together, but that I'd happily provide her with a gloriously topped waffle too. She went, nah, 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 none of that, and said she'd have a bag. She wanted no less than 20 waffles. Now, I'm usually not one for confrontation, and I was already deciding to comply. But then I realized that I owed her nothing, and backed up by the frowns of my neighbors, I told the lady that this definitely was not what I had in mind when I bought those waffles. I told her I was okay with preparing her one or two, and with sticking around for a talk, but I wasn't just going to hand them out in large numbers to complete strangers. She then raised her volume, and exaggeratedly offended, she yelled at me what my deal was, and why she was the only one denied waffles. Neighbors stepped in. I said that everything here had good intentions and even apologized for taking her chance to buy waffles from the scouts. I offered her to buy some off me if she wanted them that bad, as I still had plenty, but she was adamant on getting them for free. No way. Everyone got theirs for free. I won't be the only one paying. Something like that. Multiple attempts were made to reason with her and to make her see the intention of our event. Alas, to no avail. Neighbors isolated her, and after some irrelevant blabbering from her to a poor guy who hadn't even said a word, she stormed off. It kind of ruined my mood, but I decided to let it pass. Other families were still coming in, and the situation quickly became a bonding moment. Most were surprised hearing about it. Some already knew about her and were less surprised. About 45 minutes to an hour later, two unknown, very friendly kids showed up and ate a waffle. Most people had left by then, and I was just having drinks with some of the guys who stuck around. I had a few waffles left, and the kids asked if they could bring some home. Well, yeah, why not? The event had ended, they were friendly, and they didn't ask for many, so I complied. Happy faces ran off with a few waffles towards a lady in the distance. Yup, it was entitled Mom. And yup, those were her kids. She gave me a mean gesture in front of them, yelled something which I didn't understand, and they walked off in the distance. We had to process that for a while. Meanwhile, Entitled Mom is quite infamous around our neighborhood. She lives a few streets farther. She's employed as a caregiver in a retirement home. Poor people. And she's an absolute terror. She dumps her trash in other people's bins so she doesn't have to pay for the new paper kilo system. She blocks driveways. On several cases, reported as a package thief. Calls cops for anything. Has been seen to mistreat neighborhood cats. The list goes on. Her kids are super sweet though, which is remarkable. I luckily haven't seen much of her since the waffle incident, but I thought the story was fitting quite well here. You might say I'm a hypocrite for denying her a free bag and then later giving it to the kids, but there are some key differences. One, they were kids. Two, they were friendly. Three, they asked, didn't demand. Four, the event was nearing its end. Five, they didn't ask for a ridiculous amount. Reimbursement bounced for going over by a few cents? Cool, I'll spend 20 times that. 
worked as a freelancer in a job that almost always required travel. The per diem amount allotted for meals was actually pretty generous, which is needed when traveling. Airports, hotel, room service, and touristy areas, if you happen to be stuck there with no other options, are pricey. But it was not a true payday amount in the sense that you could spend however you wanted per day. You got a certain amount for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, but could transfer the amount between them only if you were buying all three meals in a day. Understandable, since you shouldn't get to spend a full day's amount on one meal if you didn't fly out for the job until late. One meal was easy, the amount allotted for that meal. Three was easy, can transfer between the three to use the full day amount. But you have to literally have three receipts to prove it. If you knew you were going to be on site and miss lunch, for example, we found you had to go buy a bag of chips or a banana or something for as little money as you could and claim it to be a meal to unlock the rest of the meal amount to use later. Two meals is where it got hairy. You could only use the amount for that meal and not transfer anything between them since you didn't use all three meals, hence needing to buy something random above if you were truly there all day. Was at the airport at 5 a.m. and went to the original place, a bar slash restaurant. Got an omelet and a drink or something and not wanting to stiff the server in the US tipped appropriately for that region and went about 50 cents over on breakfast. At my next layover, and since more places were open, got cheap fast food and went $10 under on lunch. When I submitted for reimbursements, it was bounced for going 50 cents over policy for breakfast. When I pointed out I went $10 under for lunch, they said that was the policy and to remove 50 cents from the expense report in order for it to be paid. In a policy meant to save the company money, I was penalized for saving them $10 because I went over 50 cents. Fine, I thought, take your 50 cents. From then on, I tried to spend every last dollar of the per diem amount, even if I wasn't hungry. I'd hoard snacks and things from the airport and take them home to eat later. I'd rather start to spend a few dollars of my own money beyond the per diem to make sure I used every last cent of theirs. These companies should really hire some YouTube speedrunners to crash test their policies the things they accidentally incentivize are insane. What's really sad is the person who initially rejected the 50 cents probably saw this new behavior and thought, oh good, now he's following the rules. Sometimes the enforcers even know the policy is dumb, tried but failed to fix it and are silently cheering you on for manipulating it. As someone in this position, I agree, though it amazes me how many people don't catch on when I explain multiple times on how they can maximize their personal benefits while being in compliance with policies. I'll even mention sometimes things have to fail in order for a change to be made, and it's not their problem or fault if they are in compliance with policy and the company gets done over for enforcing its own policies. I don't make the rules, but have to enforce them. Listen to what you're being told and you will benefit. Yet, people will often just complain and not do anything. The company knows most people will fall in line and follow the common practice of what they actually want instead of the actual policies set in place. If you don't like it, there's the door. This is my own personal story that took place in Belgium around 2015 to 2016. Context. In my mid-twenties, I worked in accounting with four other mid-twenties guys. We were a solid, well-oiled machine that ran flawlessly and yet we had way too much work and needed an extra person. We had taken over in one year from the previous team, who seemingly quit for no reason. At the end of the second quarter, we crushed through the mountain of work with a collective four weeks of overtime between us. Boss was happy and allowed us to finally go on vacation. More like he knew we had accumulated too many recovery days and gave us the bonus we were promised if we reached the goal. We've been unhappy with the situation for some time and have been complaining about it. Clearly, there's enough work to justify hiring an extra person, so we go tell the boss. As soon as we explain why we're asking for an extra person, he goes ballistic. How dare we employees who are terrible at our jobs dare ask for an extra hand when all we do is mess around for the entire day and we're costing him money. In his screaming, he points to the door and says, I'm not holding you hostage. If you're unhappy, I suggest you walk out. We're stunned. What the heck did he just say? We came in to ask for help and he's telling us to buzz off? We ask him to explain what he means. He literally says, I don't need you. I don't need any of you. Quit if you don't like it. I wish I could say we did, 
but we were stunned because we thought since we've crushed our workload, we would be in his good graces. So we shut up and let him continue his tirade. Come January, crunch time is coming. Boss gathers the entire company in a meeting room and goes on to explain how we're horrible workers and can't do anything properly and we're costing him money. He then goes on to say the company made 1000% profit compared to last year. If we're so bad at our jobs, how come we multiplied profits? He goes on to say that from now on, no more bonuses because we're crap workers and we're expected to stay in the offices until our work is done, no matter how long that may be. No exceptions. Whoever doesn't comply will be fired. He reminds us that he can replace us at any moment and that we need to prove we deserve our jobs. The thing is, I knew I was the best employee there. Not just the best accountant, but the best, innovative, most charismatic, most resourceful, and on top of that, the rest of the team and a lot of people from other departments kind of relied on my upbeat, seemingly lighthearted, jokerish attitude. And so, tired of his crap and extremely scared of the mountain of incoming work, I get up and just say, I quit. Boss doesn't understand what I mean and continues his meeting while I go to clear my desk. I've cleared my desk by the time he's finished the meeting and while I'm walking out past him, he understands what I'm doing. He immediately starts yelling that I'm abandoning my post and that it's unprofessional and there will be consequences. I'm calm because I had already made up my mind. We're in front of everyone, including the rest of my team. I simply tell him, Boss, we all heard you say that I'm free to leave at any point because you don't need me. Isn't that right, guys? No one answers, of course, because they're all, boss included, stunned that the nice guy who's always polite and keeps his head down is being assertive. Before boss gets a chance to snap out of it, I tell him that he mistook my tact and diplomacy for acceptance and that I'm only doing what he said. Maybe he should choose his words carefully next time. The rest of the team quit within three months. They knew where crap was going and they spent their time at work looking for work anyway. The other teams quit within 12 months and he was bought out within 16 months because most clients had stopped paying and sued him since he had no one to do the actual work. All because he thought I wouldn't comply with his own malicious request. Edit. It was a 15-man company. Am I the jerk for dropping him and his daughter off at a rental car place states away from home? Long story short, I, 27 female, started seeing 44-year-old Dave three years ago. I have two sons who are nine and six. He has one daughter, Anne, who's 17. I booked a road trip for me and my sons roughly three months ago. A road trip consisting of roughly 26 hours worth of driving with stops in between. This is the first time I've ever been financially able to do much of anything with my kids, so I went all out. Planned to stop at every place they had ever asked me to go to, basically. I was beyond excited to surprise them with this trip. We got home four nights ago. A week before leaving, my Dave decides he wants to go with me and bring Anne as a bonding experience. We do not live together and Anne has never liked me because I am boring. She has said this to my face. So Dave thinks it will be good. I didn't really want either of them to go, but thought, what the heck, why not? This could be good for us. Boy, was I wrong. From the moment Anne got into my car, she started complaining about absolutely everything. It was too crowded too loud. We were taking too many stops. The boys were too annoying and need to quiet down and chill. We get to a hotel nine hours in, PA. It's around 3 p.m. at this point. Dave asks if he can take a drive with Anne because she was getting irritated with the kids. I told him he could if he makes it quick because I needed to go get dinner supplies. Three hours later, he shows back up. Him and Anne went out to eat. So I make a comment saying, you didn't think we wanted to eat too? And Anne snaps back with, I don't think we asked. After comments like this for days, I finally snapped. My boys are now saying they just want to go home because several times Dave told my kids to be quiet because of his kids' comfort. At this point, I haven't done anything with my kids because the queen would have a fit if we pulled off anywhere. And Dave at this point basically refused to let me drive despite me arguing. In my car, so I snapped, told him to pull over. When he finally does, I drive to the nearest car rental and tell them to get out of my car. Dave and Anne both start flipping out. Anne saying she isn't going to get in a car that has bed bugs. 
Dave saying he didn't want to take separate vehicles and didn't have enough money for a rental because the queen spent over $1,500 in four days. So I say, I don't believe I asked, and take off. They were close to 800 miles from home. It took them four days to get home due to lack of money and needing to borrow. I'm being told I'm a selfish jerk. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Time to stop seeing Dave. They should have thought about their behavior before jacking your trip and being rude to both of you and your boys. I hope the rest of the trip was enjoyable with your boys. OP, it was fantastic without them. I'm so glad to hear that, and I hope you don't really believe you are the jerk. I bet the look on their faces was priceless. The only way OP was being a bit of a jerk was in not kicking Dave and Anne out of the car on the first day, preferably the second time Anne groused. The first time, she should have gotten a warning. They lost several days of enjoyment because OP didn't slam her foot to the floor the second that brat opened her mouth. Not the jerk. I hope you broke up with him too. OP. Oh, I did. Also, don't date men who are that much older than you and broke. Would I be the jerk if I got the same piercings as a coworker who lied? I feel kind of stupid even typing this, but people in my surroundings are decided 50-50 in this matter, so here goes. Last week, I, 23 female, was talking to my coworker, let's call her Emma, 22, about the piercings I was going to get in my ears. I'm quite a pierced person and have worked out curated ears for friends before as a hobby, so I decided to do mine as well. I made a template and everything and showed it to my coworker who really liked it. Yesterday I went to work and was excited to talk about my upcoming appointment. Another coworker suddenly accused me of being a copycat saying that I must have known Emma just got those piercings done. I confronted Emma, and sure enough, she got the exact same piercings as on my template, even some I already had. Her ears were bright red. She must have got them done the day before or something. She accused me of lying, stating that she had come up with the idea herself and I was being jealous of her new look. I was baffled. Instead of arguing further, I just grabbed my phone and showed all the other coworkers, who had gathered by now, the messages about my piercing plans. I also showed them the template I had sent her. Emma broke down crying, saying how much she loved the template and how she wanted it herself so bad she couldn't wait. I asked her why she didn't just tell me and told her I wouldn't have minded if she got the same thing, but she said she couldn't stand the idea of having the same thing as someone else. She had this thing about being one of a kind. She thought that if she got them first, I wouldn't dare to copy her and that would be it. I told her I was still getting the piercings and she flipped out, yelling and crying about how they were hers now and I can't copy her or she wouldn't be original anymore. She locked herself in the bathroom crying for half an hour when I said I didn't care about that. I still have my appointment to go get them. I curated the template to me because I have scarring on my ears so the piercings need to go in specific places so can't really change it up. I do feel bad about how Emma is taking it and don't think she would get over it fast if I got them. We work together every day. So, would I be the jerk if I got the same piercings? Not the jerk. Emma is an entitled brat. You're adults, not even teenagers. It doesn't matter who goes then first either. It's not like anyone's trying to steal the other's entire appearance. OP. Indeed. I would have loved it if she had told me she wanted them as well. Heck, we could have gotten them done together. Emma legitimately needs professional help because crying for an hour over not being original is bonkers. Not the jerk, but can I make a suggestion that you don't confide until after you get things done so no one can accuse you of copying? I'd also suggest you treat coworkers for exactly what they are, coworkers. Don't get caught up in their drama and keep it professional. Emma has issues and if the place you work for has an HR department, Make sure you document everything that happened, as I suspect she'll try and enact revenge at some point. OP. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that from now on. I tend to share a lot when I'm excited. Some coworkers were friends before we started working together. All of us do tend to hang out outside of our hours as well. Thanks for the advice. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.